Yeah, I do, but uh, for the sake of the okay, argument... Okay, so then I don't, understand, I don't understand what you're saying the third horn is. Did anybody understand what he was saying? Okay, I okay, didn't so get the it. Argument, but, but the argument presumes that the opponent is willing to concede that God created the world. Well, sorry, that the world exists, right? Everybody's going to concede that, right? So then so I, don't need a, I don't need a motive. I don't, I don't need a motive if we're conceding that this mind you is need, responsible. You for need it. a motive that the type of world that a god would create would be the type of world that we do, in fact, see, right? Because otherwise, uh, otherwise we, could, we wouldn't have an explanation for why we see the kind of world we do see. Yeah, because it wouldn't be expected. It wouldn't be expected on the hypothesis. So you're not actually offering any explanation, and there's therefore no explanatory inference to that being, right? But your argument, I take it, is supposed to be some kind of explanatory inference, right? That if we see this phenomenon, that counts as evidence for the existence of that being, right? But yeah, for something because... to be evidence, right? It has to actually be expected on the hypothesis. Yeah, but we said... It, and you're it, not showing we accept how it because you, of... you, you've granted that your hypothesis doesn't predict that outcome. So no, it's therefore not the... expected and therefore not evident. Okay, but we, we take it because of the impossibility of the contrary. Since we would have to pause it... That I don't, that's just repeating the claim, right? And if you say that it's impossible, then you need to show the contradiction entailed by the existence of beauty and God not existing. That's, that's what that's Isaac where I got. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah, so I already responded to this. If you're positing that no mind is responsible for beauty, you are necessarily positing that a non-mind is responsible for pleasures that only minds can experience, which is a non-argument, I guess, or not, not really a coherent claim, right? I'm sorry? I, I, was I not audible? So what I said is, by definition, if you're not positing God, which here is defined as a mind, right, then you're positing that a non-mind is responsible for pleasures that can only be appreciated. Might not by have an ex You cut out, Jack. Right. And assuming, sorry, all when you of, say when you out. say responsible for, when you say responsible for, you're begging the question that the phenomenon has an explanation. In first place. So I'm not taking any position, right? It might not have an explanation. It might have an explanation. If it has an explanation, I don't see a reason why we would prefer a theistic explanation to some I'll, you know, I'll, re I'll, reword, I'll, re I'll reword the argument. I thought this was in the premise, but I, I actually went over and it's not. So um, just just to clarify, I'm going to re restate the syllogism, and I'm just correcting this, right? I'm not trying to uh, obfuscate this. This was what I meant from the beginning. I just didn't include it. So if God, but God is here defined as a good God, as in like a moral God, right? If a good God does not exist, objective beauty and human perception of it would not exist. Objective beauty and human perception of it do exist. Therefore, good God Yeah, exists. but there's no what, reason what? for anybody to accept the first premise, right? Only person who would accept that premise would be somebody who's already a believer. But the world we have, but the world we have, is inconsistent with there not being a good God, right? Because of the you haven't reason. established that. I gave an argument. I gave a syllogistic argument. You didn't give an argument. I what argument a... did you give that establishes that? Yeah, that was a premise in the argument. Presumably, the, the premise isn't the thing that's established by the argument. It's the thing that's assumed by the argument. Am I, audi am I audible right now? Yeah. Okay, Okay. so you object to the pre first premise that if a good god exists... Well, uh, I, I gave, well, I didn't give an argument, but I said due to the impossibility of the contrary. I said that uh, the first premise... that's where premise... you end up with my criticism, right? When you say... Well, what's your... What's your criticism? I don't remember. You actually said yeah, that there should be some kind of contradiction. That's what you're saying? Yeah, because what do you think you're saying if you say it's impossible? Obviously, what it means for something to be logically impossible is that there's a contradiction. So if you say the contrary, which is the state of affairs where the proposition God exists is false and the proposition beauty, by which you're talking about um, something that triggers a subjective state of appreciation exists, is true... Okay, There's okay, a good. There's contradiction good. there. So, what, wait, so no, are you, you, ha are you, you, half, you half listened and started saying good halfway through. It's like you, 
So there's two propositions there. God doesn't exist. Beauty does exist. If those are both true, you have to be able to derive a contradiction. And if you can't, then don't say that the contrary is impossible. Oh, okay. Are, are you familiar with the anthropic principle? I don't know why you're asking me a question instead of just explaining what the contradiction is. Well, the um, the contradiction is that by... Um, by okay, so you're basically... But, okay, so I would say the contradiction is definitional, and I, I'll explain what I mean. Right. So if you are talking about beauty, you you must necessarily say that for us to even be talking about beauty, the world must be compatible with leaving things being able to appreciate beauty. But on the theory, right, on the theory that denies God's existence, there absolutely is no a priori – good God's existence, sorry. Good God's existence, there's absolutely no a priori reason see, why see, this would be I've, the case. I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to draw your attention to this problem with how you argue, like, so many times. And I, at this point, I've just accepted that it's not going to get through to you, but I'm just going to try to say it again, Okay. When someone asks you, when you make a claim that requires you to deliver proof of some contradiction, and someone just asks, what is the contradiction? Every single time you respond by building up some kind of inference and not clarifying what the contradiction is. So if I just ask you, don't give me an inference. We'll save that and do that in a minute, okay? Just what is the contradiction you're trying to get to? I, to I, told, I told you. I told you. Qualia both exists and doesn't exist. That's the contradiction. I already gave this contradiction. Okay, so you have to be able to give some sound argument that gets from the propositions that God doesn't exist and beauty, which we know what you mean by that, does exist, that qualia both exists and doesn't exist. So if you want to give some argument for that, then go ahead. Yeah, qualia presupposes the anthropic principle. Do you know what the anthropic principle it did, it is? Didn't, it didn't sound like an argument to me. Okay, are are you expecting every single word to be syllogistic? I already gave so many uh, syllogistic. I am I am expecting an argument. You know, call me crazy, but you're making claims. Arguments are good if you're making claims. Okay, okay, okay. So so let, let me try to uh, be more formal so you don't. Uh, have a, so I can pigeonhole hold you better, right? So the contradiction contradiction is that under your view, you're essentially saying that qualia both exists and doesn't exist. I'll give a reason why, right? Because qualia is by definition not physical. Uh, this objection, to be fair, only applies to you because you're the only one who's um who, who's positing like the physicalism. Like I, I wasn't even intending this as a rebuttal. Wait, to no, what? No, I didn't. I didn't say anything about physicalism or non-physicalism. That's completely beside the point, right? The person running, the person who makes this objection to you, could be a physicalist or a non-physicalist. So if you're about to try to give some response that assumes your interlocutor is a physicalist, you're just utterly failing. Okay, so I, I wasn't done, right? I wasn't going to present an argument against physicalism. What no, I was I just trying to say present an argument against physicalism. I just heard you say that this applies specifically to you because you're a physicalist. And I just pointed out that if your line of response is to give a response that only applies to physicalists, you're failing because a non-physicalist like Jack could run the same criticism, right? Like, I mean, you could even ask him, Jack, do you think that anything that was just said by me somehow commits me to physicalism? Not that I could see. Well, you did say that uh, beauty for you is the reactions that we have to it. No, no but... I'm, I asked. I asked what you mean by beauty. I'm just working with your definitions. I'm not insisting oh, on any that's of fair. my that's, own that's, definitions. That's, that's, that's fair. That's fair. But okay, so so let let's see where the disagreement is. Uh, so you you disagree with the first premise, right? And the first premise is that a good god. Uh, so so the first premise is if a good god does not exist, objective beauty and human perception of it would not exist. This is the premise mm -hmm. you disagree with. That that's the premise you have a problem with. Yeah. Okay. What's the objection? The objection is I don't see a reason to take it to be true. Your response and I, to that. And, and, sorry. Uh, impossibility of the con exactly. And then the response to that is what contradiction is entailed on the contrary. Right, which is where the problem. And I gave, and I exists. and I gave, and I gave it both. Okay, qua I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, yeah, right. So I, I know where it goes from here, right? So then you say the contradiction is qualia exists and qualia doesn't exist, and then from there we get to how, what is your argument that gets from the propositions that God doesn't exist 
and beauty does exist to qualia does and doesn't exist. I'll be right back, sorry. Okay. Okay, so... Uh... I actually will also, but I'll probably be back sooner than Jack. Just one sec. <laughs> yeah, but, okay, but uh, I'll, I'll respect to, to those in the room who... Um... Um, well, I, I'll, I'll still uh, respond to the question. Well, okay, so I said that, yeah, Jack and Ava actually, well, yeah, I, I will, I, I think that uh, Isaac is getting at something, but I, I don't think he um, he's appreciating the depth of what I'm saying, right? Because I think the contradiction is entailed because uh, qualia would be, qualia would be basically have to be redefined under the model of no God existing. Right, which 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 would be, which would, now of course Jack can posit that beauty is a brute fact, which which probably makes it harder, but but th that that still but that still doesn't explain why it's applying only to minds, right? That's where I have the problem, because I I think that Isaac is conceding that if beauty is objective. And by objective we mean that it's not dependent on any one mind. Right? Oh, but that could just be another brute contingency. Huh? It could just be another brute contingency. Should the issue is that Jack is positing that it's an unexplained thing, right? But, and then you said, well, what explains that it only applies to minds? Well, that could just be another unexplained contingency, right? I guess so, but anytime you posit brute facts in such a scenario, uh, you could posit brute facts before it, right? And you wouldn't even know that you would get to it. You would need you need to be objective for your argument to work. It is. I, I already defined that it is, whoever that is. I can't see you. Sorry. How can well, you I don't understand. Who, who was, don't who, understand who, who was what I just said. Who, who, who was um, that? You said Sasha, shut up. Who was that that just spoke up? Andricus. Andricus. Okay, good, good. So you said that you don't agree with premise two, right? Well, sorry, I, I just came back, actually. So That's fine, yeah. Just, just what, what is, why would we accept that if God doesn't exist and beauty does exist, then qualia does and doesn't exist? What's the argument for that? Um, qualia seems to be uh, teleological in nature. So teleology would go out of the way window without a mind. Can you give like an argument with premises and a conclusion? Yeah, qualia. Uh, okay, so premise. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to think it up right now, but I, I can try. Uh, qualia presupposes the anthropic principle. Premise two: anthropic principle is related to teleology. Premise three: on the model, there is no teleology. Premise four: qualia doesn't exist. Okay, but you need to start from the propositions that um, God doesn't exist and beauty does exist. All right, you just gave some totally that, that's a contra that's a con that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. No, because as you're, I said no, you're arguing that it. Okay, first of all, it's not a contradiction. Those are two separate. You really like. I wish, I wish I could just get this through your head, like. There is nothing I could encourage you to do more than just like read an intro to logic text so you get clarity on what things like arguments are, what contradiction means. It'll be like exquisitely helpful to you, okay? Um, but no, it's not a contradiction to say God exists and, or sorry, God doesn't exist and beauty does exist. Those are not the same proposition, right? You're trying to say it entails a contradiction. And the contradiction that's supposed to be entailed is that qualia exists and qualia doesn't exist. But then when you're asked for an argument that goes from those propositions to the contradiction supposedly entailed by them, you just gave a completely separate argument that didn't start from those propositions. Am I audible? Of course. Why, why would you? Why do you keep asking that? You're not going to suddenly become not audible unless you have some kind of like tech problem over there. Oh no no no! The push to talk thing is confusing. I don't usually use it, <laughs> but I don't usually do the push to talk. This one requires me to do. But yeah, so Isaac, I, I think it's a bit pedantic to be chasing me about this, like because I I I, I haven't really like what do you mean you chasing you. 
like like you you seem to steamroll the conversation right uh no, about no, i some... just don't like being talked over when someone's not answering a criticism i i did answer the criticism but the criticism just goes from one topic to another topic i want you to pose objections to the art to the premises now i gave the three premises i want to hear your objections instead of just asking me to always provide argument i gave the, what's your objection to the first premise and you're just saying show me a contradiction show me a contradiction i'm asking what's the objection so the whole line of objections is this okay you gave this argument if a good god exists or sorry, if a good God doesn't exist, beauty doesn't exist, beauty exists, therefore a good God exists. We said, okay, well, why would we accept premise one? You said... Um, the impossibility of the contrary. Right. And then we said, why would we accept that the contrary is impossible? What's the contradiction that's entailed by the propositions God doesn't exist and beauty exists? And you say the contradiction is that qualia does and doesn't exist. And then we say, yeah. okay, well, why would, what's the, what's the inference that moves from those propositions? God, ex God doesn't exist. Okay. And, okay. Sorry, so qualia. Sorry. God doesn't exist and beauty does exist to the contradiction supposedly entailed by them that qualia does and doesn't exist. Right. And I just want to say it at this point. Now you're complaining about me asking you to deliver that argument, but this is still just trying to get you to establish p1 of your original argument right it's not fair to end up like you know one layer down and trying to justify your premise realize you can't do it and then just try to flip the dialogue on the other person right you can't give any reason to accept the first premise of your argument that's on you okay so uh here here is the reason why qual why uh it's impossible to have beauty uh, or qualia uh, in a scenario where there is no god Okay. Well, because I would argue that uh, qualia presumes teleology. Since you do not have teleology in a godless universe, you do not have qualia. Am I clear? I find it too frustrating to engage with you, to be honest, because you keep, like, you don't understand. You're saying that the propositions, God doesn't exist and beauty does exist in conjunction, lead to the contradiction that qualia does and doesn't exist. Yes. You keep you keep giving arguments that don't start from those propositions. I just want to hear some argument that starts from those propositions and okay. ends at qualia okay. does and doesn't exist. Okay, okay, okay. But so I'm, I'm uh, honestly, I'm probably going to step out now because you know. All right, take I, care. I'm take not care. that interest. Yeah. Okay. All right, take care. Bye. Now, for uh, who was that that asked something? Okay, so Andricus, you you dis. Okay, he's gone. But basically, somebody have, disagreed with me that. I had an objection. Yeah, you Sasha, you're that... trolling me. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay, okay go ahead. So you okay, said go ahead. that you said that the problem with Jack's criticism, uh, namely that the existence of beauty could just be a brute contingency, is that it's also going to be unexplained why only minds can appreciate beauty. But it could just be another brute contingency. And I haven't heard a response to that. I've made the point earlier. You just seem to kind of like gloss over it. Yeah, yeah, I, I got that, but, um, okay, fine, I got that, but, uh, I, uh, the, the objection there would be that beauty posits qualia, and qualia posits teleology, and, uh, in a godless universe, teleology is impossible. I don't understand. Are you accepting yeah, you're, that? I, I, you... I know you don't understand, I, I know you don't understand. Look, look, I'm asking you if you understand that you made an objection to the earlier point. And I've made an objection to that, right? And it sounds like you're giving a different point now. Yeah, I, I don't remember if I gave anything else. Maybe I did. Okay, I, I but let's say that we move on to the thing you want to talk about yeah. now, which is that teleology yeah. can't exist without God. Well, exactly. like I assume you're going to say something like it presupposes the anthropic principle, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Why couldn't that just be brute as well? Yeah, why couldn't it just be brute as well? Uh, what? The teleolo teleology? Yeah. Like, why couldn't the existence of teleology just be brute as well? Because teleology hints at design. Because teleology what? Well, then that would... In, in no, I'm asking, can you just repeat system. what you said? Because teleology can't what? Teleology can't exist without God. No, but that is repeating the claim. I'm giving you an alternative explanation for teleology, right? And you're just repeating... There, like there, you you know, do you know what tele, do you know what teleology is? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, define for me what teleology is. Um, it's like goal orientedness. Is that about you're right? close. The one I, you're close. I, I would give that uh, explanation of phenomena in terms of the purpose they serve, rather than of the cause by which. You're just reading this off of Google. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I was about. I was about to say that I'm going to read a philosophical definition. I was just trying. This to This is that. the Google okay. definition. Yeah, okay, I, I so... just. I just read it from a dictionary. That, that's what I was trying. I wasn't presenting that. I was saying it off the top of my mind. That, that's the definition I was working with with teleology. I had it open. So uh, I would say that in a world where God doesn't exist, right, purpose-orientedness is uh, – I mean, if purpose-orientedness is a brute fact, it's not purpose-orientedness. So it's, it's a pro- – there is Why no such that? thing as purpose – Wait, but because something asking, has to be purpose, about... because something because 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 something has to be purpose oriented in virtue of something else, right? If it's a brute fact, it's not purpose oriented in virtue of something else. Therefore, teleology can't exist, right? I don't know. So that that's the problem. I know you don't. I, I didn't expect. I didn't expect you to understand. But I thought that's the point of an explanation, right? I'm presuming that if I ask no. other people in the room if they understood, like they're just gonna say that they didn't understand as well. But, like, I don't really understand. We're talking about the existence of teleology, right? So I take it that you mean that there is yeah. at least one thing that is goal-oriented, that, yeah, yeah whatever, yeah. however you want to define it, right? Okay, so I'm just asking, why does that require an explanation other than it's just brute? Because for something to be purpose-oriented, it has to be purpose-oriented in virtue of something else. Why? I, am I not being audible right now? You're audible. It's just. Did you explain why that's the case? Why is yeah, it being for some, something else? That's, that's, that, that's definitional. That's definitional. So really? if you are. So, what? yeah. So, so if, you, if you're you serving some purpose. <laughs> so if you're. Just a second. If you're serving. So if, if there is a purpose that's being um, attained, right? Uh, there is a virtue. Uh, in due to which you are either close or further away from that goal, right? Now, if it's a brute fact, right, then there is no thing. So it may not that... be a brute fact how far close or far you you are away from achieving some goal, but that doesn't mean that the teleology in the first no, you're, place you're, you're, that's a that's a category error, right? That's not what? teleology. I'm not talking about human intentions. I'm talking about um, purpose orientedness of. Um, of the universe. What, what difference is that? What? what? Yeah, I don't, it would still be in virtue of an. I, 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 couldn't, right? I couldn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. I said, you'd still have to be saying in virtue of intentions of some kind, is how I take I, this. And maybe you're saying I God's wasn't saying intentions. that. But... No, uh, a Canadian Catholic. Uh, who was talking? I couldn't see. Sorry. This is Ninja. Ninja oh, oh, there you are. So, yeah, I, I would say that uh, I think this started when uh, Isaac asked me what's the contradiction, and I said the contradiction is that qualia both exist and doesn't exist under the atheist worldview, and then he asked me, how do you get to that? And I said it's definitional, because qualia necessitates teleology, and in atheistic worldview, there is no teleology. Yeah, both of those seem false, it. or at least dubious yeah. to me. I don't... <laughs> Why I don't, is I don't see what the presuppose teleology? And why yeah, is teleology why? impossible on atheism? Because teleology presumes purpose-driven... Pur- purpose... Uh, sorry, what was the definition I read again? Yeah, <laughs> so the phenomena... Inter- uh, it presumes that phenomena serve a purpose, right? So, okay. so in an atheism... Yeah. yeah. That could be so, true on atheism. So how, how did... Do... No, but you would have to have the purpose being a brute fact, right? Why? What? And even if it is a brute fact, what's the issue? What the... the issue is that the purpose has to be served in virtue of something else. That's Why? just begging the question against bruteness, though. You're just saying it can't be a brute fact because it can't be a brute fact. But you're not understanding. What I'm saying is it can't be... It can't... So it has to be either closer or farther away from serving that purpose in virtue of correctness, right? 
in virtue of how it stands. But how in close or far of what it is away from serving that purpose just says nothing about whether it's. Um, but but do you understand that, that in a world? But do you understand that in a? But do you understand that in a world where there is no innate purpose? It doesn't make sense to say how further or closer these uh, phenomena are to achieving their purpose because all of it is. You're missing the objection. We're accepting theology, but asking why it ha can't be proved. Because that's a self contradiction. Teleology you haven't explained why it is. And, and even and, and beyond that, um, you haven't explained why it could be explained and uh, not explained in terms of a, a God or not at least necessitate a God. So you cut out at the last. So you again, you haven't explained why it can't be proved, right? And you haven't explained why it can't be explained on atheism. Because atheism precludes the possibility of teleology. What says who? What what's what's the issue there? I don't understand. Because for an atheist, if teleology exists, it must be a brute fact. If it's a brute fact, then it's not closer. For, then what, what's the virtue? Okay. So that's, that's wrong twice over again, right? It, <laughs> I don't see why it, it, it's in, in, uh, uh, incoherent to say the teleology, some, something is teleological and, and it is so uh, brutally. And I don't see why um, uh, appealing it to it as a brute fact is required if it's to be appealed to at all on atheism. Right? Sorry, that was phrased poorly, but you know what I mean, right? Why would the atheist have to say that it's a brute fact? It's otherwise it presumes. Well, I, I, I don't know. I've never heard the the idea that uh, atheists accept teleology. I've never heard such a thing. do. I don't... I, I don't know. It's just your argument. You're saying Thomas that it's inconsistent. Thomas Nagel does. Yeah, sure. So, in virtue of what is something closer or further wise. away from it? No, no, no. But, but I was asking. I was asking if you're an atheist, in virtue of what is a phenomena closer or further but from you, achieving its you purpose? You understand that's an unfair move, though, because that's you just shifting the burden, right? Like you're saying that you can't have teleology on atheism. But I gave a reason don't... why, because you need something, you need something else in virtue of which it's either further or closer away from its purpose, right? Yeah, but that's, well, they've, they've how is... Twofold response to that, he's saying, like, firstly, no, it could be brute, and then secondly, it could be that there is such a thing on atheism. You asking him what that thing is... Well, that, that's, a god. A, that's a god, that's a god, that's a god, that's a god. what that thing that's is... A, that's a god, that's sorry, not atheism. You asking him what that thing is, A, dodges the response that it could be brute, and B, shifts the burden of proof onto him to explain what the atheist account for teleology is, as opposed to you doing what you need to do the, with the burden you put on yourself by saying such an account is impossible, right? So it shifts the burden and it dodges the uh, response that it's brute. I think he's also a little bit confused on what it would mean for a teleology to be brute, right? It, it may not be brute, um, that uh, something is fulfilling its purpose or not fulfilling its purpose. That could be explained, right, in terms of various facts, right? Um, but in virtue, but what but could when be, you're saying what, something's what, fulfilling... Man, what could but, still but be you, just a, that just it has a, that just, let, let me, in the first place. I was finishing right. my thought. Go okay, ahead. got it. I, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. But look, when you're talking about purpose, right, there has to be some way for you to say that something gets either further or closer to fulfilling sure. its purpose, right? There has to be in virtue of something else, right? When you're right. saying that there is nothing like that, uh, then... No, I'm not saying that. Okay, but so then, you then if you're you saying you're just conceding... You're saying that. Then you're conceding no. that there is a God. That's it. That's as no. simple as it is. So, oh, wrong in two ways. So first, of, first off, um, when I'm saying, when I say that, right, oh, there could be something that explains why it's uh, closer further uh, from achieving its purpose, that doesn't mean that its teleology isn't brute, right? That it has a particular teleology might be a brute fact, and that it's closer, further away from achieving that, uh, fulfilling that purpose may not be, right? There's something inconsistent with that. Um, but either way, I, I just don't see where you get the theism here. Right? Um, and even beyond that, um, even if you do get to theism, 
this is just a completely different argument. This has just nothing to do with the original argument from beauty being presented. No, no. What I'm, what I'm, no. So, so what, what the problem was here that I'm necessitating that someone who says that they can have uh, beauty without God is implying that you can have qualia without God. And someone who's saying that you can have qualia without God is saying that you can have teleology without God. And I'm saying that since it's impossible to have teleology without God, it's impossible to have qualia without God. And if it's impossible, sorry, sorry, if it's impossible to have qualia without God, it's impossible to have beauty without God. Thus, we are again stuck with the first premise, right? Due to the impossibility of the contrary. And to repeat, the first premise is... If a good if a good God does not exist, objective beauty and human perception of it would not exist. I just gave an evident reason for why. Number two, objective beauty and human position perception do exist, so the conclusion is that God exists. Right? He, this he is kind, the He kind of misrepresented the flow there of the conversation. So he gave that argument. We asked what's the argument for premise one. He said the impossibility of the contrary. <laughs> we asked right, we asked, well, what contradiction is entailed by the propositions God doesn't exist and beauty exists both being true. He said the contradiction is that qualia does and doesn't exist. Then, and this is where he diverged from actually arguing about the original topic, we said, okay, well, what's the argument that goes from those two propositions to the conclusion that qualia does and doesn't exist? And at that point, he started making some separate argument about teleology, right? Not giving an argument that starts from those two propositions and reaches the desired conclusion that qualia does and doesn't exist. So that's how yeah, we just, got on to the teleology. It just seems to me that this is an argument. Uh, I get how you're framing it, CC, but it just seems to me like this is an argument from qualia to God, right? I just, the point about beauty just seems to be doing no work here. No, because qualia can be can be negative or positive. So, so qualia itself is not an argument. What I'm saying yeah, is... Yeah, but the point was that the argument you're making makes no difference. It's not appealing to it being negative or positive. You're just saying qualia is presupposed to theology, which requires... Um, your qualia is redundant as well in the argument, because you just need teleology. <laughs> right? Like, if you just agree that teleology exists, well, no, you don't need wait, qualia Seth, and don't, you don't need beauty. I don't, well, it's redundant for anyone who already accepts teleology, but if you think... You might convince someone based on well, yeah. are you, are you saying it's redundant with respect to his second or his first argument because it's not redundant with respect to the first argument like the whole the beauty exists uh, argument the way that we got on to talking about qualia was he thinks that the contradiction entailed by the first well, by sorry by the premises in the first proposition both being false um would be uh or sorry, not both being false. What, whatever. By by the by the condition that makes the um, implication come out false. He's saying that the contradiction entailed there is that qualia exists and doesn't exist. So whatever, it, however, he's attempting to get there, the qualia thing is clearly relevant to the first argument. The separate path he's gone down about teleology. I don't know what the relevance is there, though. No, but if you have that argument, for well, I have, I have not, I have not, I have not, I have not, I have. Well, because I have, I have not formed you, because I don't have a formal argument. Because, wait, because Sa I, Sasha, we, we, we agree, though, that as he's framed it, the qualia thing is relevant to the first argument, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying that, is look, I, I, don't have, I don't have a defense for qualia leading directly to God. I mean, I haven't formulated it before. I have a good experience with dealing with the argument of be from beauty, right? But to be honest, the first time I heard it, I also thought it was stupid. I, it took some studying to come and defend the argument but, from beauty but do you have an argument that goes from the propositions that god doesn't exist and beauty does exist to the contradiction that qualia does and doesn't exist because that's what you need unless you just want to totally shift tracks onto some other argument well i don't know if i have a formal one i'd have to think about that okay well i would maybe encourage you to uh to do that you're still not refuting the argument. You're just simply saying, find me a contradiction, find me a contradiction. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying that you can't defend the first premise of the argument. Clearly. Well, I, 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 I do think... Well, I, I mean, do you at least concede that the argument is formally valid? Sure, it's modus tollens. Okay. So, so, so your objection is just with the soundness. So you concede the second premise too? Um, beauty as in, yeah, if, if by all we mean by beauty is just that there are things that we, uh, have this psychological response to, or there's things out there that give us that psychological response, then I don't really see a problem with that. I mean, 
you could you could like question it if you went to some crazy level of skepticism and started saying you know maybe the external world doesn't exist maybe it's somehow all inside my mind so there isn't anything out there that you know causes this response to me but like i'm happy to just like at least for the sake of argument grant that premise it seems way less objectionable than the first one but okay fine but would you be willing to concede that um the argument from beauty uh is solid against materialism I don't understand why. Wait, but why are we asking about materialism now? I think that re regardless. No, I'm, of, I'm, I'm just wondering. I'd have to think about it. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it from that angle, but this is my criticism. My criticism is I don't know why we'd accept the first premise. You say it's impossible. I ask what the contradiction is. You say it's that qualia does and doesn't exist. And I'm asking what ar what argument is there that goes from the propositions God doesn't exist and beauty does to qualia does and doesn't exist. And if you don't have an argument for that, you should not, you know, you should not be telling people this is a sound argument because it obviously isn't. Another so point. I have another, I have another, I, I actually have another formulation of, uh, of the argument from beauty that specifically goes against materialism. So, so it's, um... But is that, so, is that, well, I mean, I guess it, it's up to people in the room if they want to hear that. But can, can you concede that at present you're not able to give us a reason to think that this argument as you gave it the first time, at least, is sound? No, I think it's sound. I just don't have a formal argument for to, to, from the, for the way you I, asked for the I, first question. I, I know that you have this belief that it's sound, but I'm asking if you would be able to concede that, you know... No, no, no. I, I, think, I think it's a... I, I've defended this argument a lot of times. Wait, but surely you don't think that you've given us a reason to accept the first premise, do you? I, His I, name I, is I, not Shirley. <laughs> Fuck off! Why? Why do you? Why do you have to obstruct this conversation? Um, CC, what you yeah. must agree s certainly that um, you haven't given us a reason airplane? to accept what airplane? Okay, I don't know what the fuck you guys are doing. Stop trolling me. Do you agree that you haven't given us a reason to think that the first premise of this argument is true? No, I did. I did give the argument. I just don't have a formal way of expressing right now off the well, top I mean, of my head. I'm right? not saying it has to be rigidly formal, but just like at and least I, at I, least I gave one. I gave one. It's the impossibility of the contrary, and <laughs> no. you're asking. Me... No, that's that's. The I don't claim. know why people say that the impossible. It's just the worst. It's, it's like... never. It's never informative, right? No, because it's a true dichotomy, and in a true dichotomy, if the other option is uh, impossible, the, the but, first one should that's be... That's just uh, repeating the claim, right? That's not a justification. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how, but even if you don't agree, I, I, st I still stick Look, that... Look, if uh, you say... If you s it's well, tantamount to saying... Accept that. To give, you say you know, due to the impossibility something. of the contrary, you're just repeating the claim. Because what it means to say that it's necessarily true is that the contrary is impossible. Right, you're not adding anything. Yeah, you're just saying exactly. that it's necessary twice. Like, I don't know where this got started, if it goes to Greg Bonson... It's hard to believe even Greg Bonson could be that stupid, you know? Like, the guy had a PhD, right? Like, how could he not understand that? Like, I understand why people as dumb as Matt Slick and, and Darth. Darth Dawkins say this, you know? Let's throw Jay in there um, also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Right, exactly. But I can understand that, but, like... I assume they're they're getting this from. I guess we could ask DGH or Dan Lindford, or, um, Alex Malpass, maybe. I assume it comes from Bonson or Van Til. Probably Bonson, I think. But, um, but like, why why do they why would they be so stupid as to think they're saying anything informative when they say that? Yeah, I think it is Bonson. That's my memory. Like, why does he think? Why does he think he's saying anything when he says that? So, CC, would it be 
you know, too much to ask that you concede you haven't given us a good reason to accept the first premise, even if you think there is a reason out there. Surely you can... No, I, yeah, I, 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 th I think that I have. I really don't want to let that terrible argument from Qualia go, though. I mean, that was... <laughs> don't let it Don't let it go. Because <laughs> CC is, like, loads of fun. Like, it's endless. Like, look at how he's not conceding the point right now. Like, what is that? I said I said that I really don't have a formal one, but I do think that but, there wasn't that, a that's good objection. Straw man of what we're asking for, like it's great if it's formal, but we're just asking at, just something that starts from the right assumptions. I I, I, right I, I did all I did give that already. Okay, well I sure didn't hear it. And do you think <laughs> did you anybody else by, hear? Do you think Must the, have missed it. Do you think you did anybody else hear? The contrary is impossible. I didn't hear it. Okay, so I'll repeat it one more time. Okay, so so okay, let's, let's just, to, just to be totally so I, clear, I, by okay. it you okay. mean the argument. Okay, but you goes... you you should let me talk in English, okay? okay so I, we, I, I, I we can't talk. Right we can't talk, talk in together. We can't together. We can't talk together, right? If if you want me to explain, I have to talk. I, I just want you to talk about the right thing. You're giving the argument right now that goes okay. from the propositions that God doesn't exist and beauty does to yeah. the contradiction yeah. that qualia doesn't. Okay, cool. Okay, good. So, so now are you willing to let me talk in English? Yeah, I'm just sa saving <laughs> okay, you time if you're going to go off topic okay, for like okay. a million times. Okay. He won't let so you let's talk, talk in Georgian, though. I'm going to talk in Mongolian. Okay, shut up, whoever that was. Now, <laughs> now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to time how long it's going to take you for you to interrupt me, okay? So, so I have a timer here, and we're going to see how long <laughs> it's going to actually take for you to jump in, okay? So uh, here, here we go. I'm going to start again. So, uh, just, just uh, Jack, come on, just give me a second. Okay, so he, he, here is the problem. If you're saying that you have a scenario where you have beauty and you do not have God, you're necessarily, definitionally proposing that you have a scenario without God and with qualia. Okay? If you do not have God and you have qualia, then you're proposing that you have teleology without a god or a disembodied mind in this case, right? However, if you have teleology that is a brute fact and non-contingent on a mind, there is nothing in virtue of which um, something can be closer or further away from its purpose. Thus, you do not have teleology and you do not have qualia and you do not have beauty in a world without God. Was that clear, Isaac? It was a string of non sequiturs. Uh, yeah, that was the yeah. same bad argument that I objected to earlier, right? I had explained how you're... Okay. Look, I already explained this. So, <laughs> first, to say that some um, there being a purpose, something, something having a certain theology, um, that being brute doesn't require that there's nothing in virtue of what it's closer or further away from it fulfilling that purpose, right? That could be explained. Um, yet, it's still yet it having that teleology could still be brute. So that's that's a, just a false premise in your argument. And the other false premise, or at least unjustified one, is that on atheism, teleology must be brute. I don't see why we would grant that. Do you understand the two objections? I do. So I'm asking for you to show me any other way teleology can exist. That's just shifting the burden. Okay, I mean, you could you could probably argue that it's the argument from ignorance, and and it does seem like it. So I'm gonna try I'm gonna try to formulate it. Um, if if you're okay, fine. If you're proposing that it doesn't have to be brute, uh, anything in virtue of which, uh, something is closer or further from its purpose would be defined as God. So you've defeated your own purpose. Okay. So do do you understand? Do you understand? Why, the why would that be defined as God? What if the thing in virtue of which it's because, because that's further how, away because is that's, because not that's minded what God, or anything like what we because, consider a God to be? No, that's a non sequitur. It's a non sequitur. Something <laughs> has to be an argument. To be the other, the other issue is how do you get from qualia <laughs> to teleology? But I'm just leaving that aside. And it doesn't even seem like the qualia part has to be there, right? Because just, there's nothing. It seems right like a lot it. of people could 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 claim that something can be beautiful whether or not it's perceived, right? Like you could make that claim, right? Oh, sure. but he's he's doing something definitional with beauty. He wants to say beauty is just the thing that causes us to have a certain. 
kind of um, yeah but the fact that it causes that's a dispositional prop right exactly it's not objective the point is that's a dispositional property mm -hmm. right and so yes, all that's required is some us, kind of counterfactual of... yeah so well, then you don't have, doesn't have to actually be any existing beings for that property to be ascribed right <laughs> He said earlier he could show that beauty was objective. Oh, oh, you're saying? Sorry, I think I understand what you're saying. You're you're just saying if if all he means by beauty is things in the world that would provoke this certain kind of response. That's right. Us, that yeah, even yeah. if the minds don't exist, you could still have things that would provoke that response in us. Were we to exactly? Exist. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I do. So you don't that. even need qualia. You don't even need qualia there no no but the, the first argument actually had in the premise that it's both the existence of beauty and its perception that are uh, evidence for god well, when well we reformulated it we dropped part of that but we can go back to that i guess you can add that in but i don't think that's going to take you very far because you're still going to fall afoul of the dilemma that i raised for you wait well, is I, the argument because there's beautiful oh. things therefore god i think he's going to more or less. Um, that's before reading no, no, con concrete. That's not concrete. The ca case is more concrete. like this. In a in, in a a priori, there is absolutely no reason why we would expect a basically beautiful world under the atheistic view. But in a theistic view, there is good reasons to expect it. Therefore, the probability of the theistic view goes up. Wait, Do you get now, that? Now it's a probabilistic argument. It's completely different. Yeah, I explained how the probabilistic argument doesn't work. I just had a question. Yeah, you gave a, you gave a false dile uh, you gave a false dilemma, right? So Wait, I, I don't have the, to. Like... What was the what was the third horn of the dilemma? I didn't never got that. Yeah, third, you said that. What's uh, the third horn that allows you to evade the dilemma? What's the third horn it. of the dilemma? Hmm. <laughs> the third horn. The, th the third horn could just be. Just a second. The third horn could just be that. Uh, since the universe exists, the whole first the whole first horn isn't even part of the dilemma at all. Since we don't we don't have to posit the motive as long as we know that that uh, mind is responsible reason, for the reason why you posit a motive is for, the reason why you posit a motive is in order to generate the expectation of the outcome. Right, that's how you actually get evidence. We don't need a motive. Right? We don't because need a motive. The problem is. You have to put some sort something there, a motive or some sort of disposition or something, right? How else are you going to? Yeah, put because a mind the simplicitor, a mind simplicitor is consistent with there being no beauty, with there being ugliness, with there being no universe, anything. It's consistent with everything, with every outcome. Well, I said it. It's a good god, right? I, I, that was in the so, so the mind is assumed but, to be okay. Good. Now that, but see, this just. Cut out this just. Sorry, this just seems like edging into the other horn of the dilemma, right? That you're just constructing a just so story. Like I can say, I, I can say, you know, the reason why. Is that the horn of the dilemma? The, the, from, oh, I don't know what that was. From the existence of cheese, right? We have confirmation of the hypothesis that there's a god that likes cheese, right? Oh, that's clearly true, right? It, it is actually expected on the god liking cheese hypothesis would, would be that we would encounter cheese. We do encounter a world with cheese in it. Therefore, we've raised the probability of the cheese liking god hypothesis, right? But it's just not an interesting... Hypothesis, explanatory hypothesis. Nobody would think that's a good explanation. Well, maybe people would think it, but they'd be wrong to think it. Yeah, but that would be just a post-hoc reason, whereas I'm arguing that definitionally God is defined as good. That's not post-hoc, right? Well, I, I don't get what? it. What's the difference? 
a good go a good god raises the probability of us experiencing sensory pleasures that are only related to minds. Yeah, there is no cheese other. Cheese loving god is this, does the same thing with respect to cheese. Uh, what's the, how are but they a cheese similar? loving but, but a cheese loving god is designed to explain the existence of cheese, whereas a good god isn't designed to explain the existence of beauty a, a, a prior uh, sorry a posteriori right or ad hoc. Uh, it's it's the good Seems god. To me that is it was. I don't understand. But I'm not. I'm not positing a god that likes beauty, right? I'm just positing a good god and saying that good god is consistent with the world where we experience sense. Hey, but pleasure. consistency, consistency is not enough. Well, you can say it's not enough, but it, it still it still raises the probability. It's merely, the, no, it is, it doesn't. I, I it could be consistent. It could be consistent with all outcomes, right? It wouldn't raise the probability of any outcome. Uh, it wouldn't raise the probability of some specific outcome if it was consistent with it. Yeah. Well, Isaac, uh, what, what, was this your first time hearing the argument from Beauty? No. Asked. Oh, sorry, sorry, I was muted. No. You have, you have. What's the formulation you've heard before? Have you heard Richard Swinburne defend it? I just usually hear something along the line. It's like the moral argument. It's just like, oh, if morality exists, then God exists. Morality exists, therefore God exists. If beauty exists, therefore then God exists. Beauty exists, therefore God exists. It's usually just something like that. Okay, but have you heard my formulation before? No, your your formulation is, is special. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question to CC about teleology. So you said that... Yeah. Like things, the goal of things has to be God, right? Uh, in virtue of something, yeah. Okay, but why couldn't it be in virtue of the thing itself? Because th th because that's a self defeating position. Okay, so you're saying that for something to have a goal, that goal can be within itself, right? Yeah. So what I'm okay, saying okay, is, but you have to wait, have. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. But then, what is God's purpose? Because if what we mean by theological purpose, like it has to be God, right? That's what you said. But then the theological purpose cannot be the thing itself. It doesn't seem Self like God has any purpose. Yeah, the reason. Right. Yeah, the reason for God is self-contained. Can you hear yeah, me? You said that it's, was impossible. I'm not. No, I'm not saying that it is itself. I'm saying that God's purpose is self-contained. Okay, but then why couldn't it be that it's like for other things? Because then you're giving agency. If they have self-contained purposes, then they have agency. So you can't give agency to beauty unless you are proposing some kind of pantheist. There's no, sorry, paganistic god. Wait, wait, I don't understand. You said that, like, teleology... I know, I know, I know that you don't understand. Yeah, so I'm asking you to clarify, right? You said that teleology was impossible in the atheistic world because the goal yeah. of things has to be... Um, God right? in virtue of something so like a teleological thing something, yeah. would be like uh, like an animal that's moving towards some sort of goal or an agent moving towards some goal yes um, okay exactly so, so, the problem so to with, have uh, that movement wait, towards wait, a goal wait, wait, we have wait. to have a virtue wait, wait wait hold on but what was the problem with saying that the purpose of that agent or that, or that animal is self-contained hello can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to say that, then that agent would have to be atemporal. And obviously, that's if you're positing such an agent, that's just God. I don't understand. Why is it that it has to be atemporal? Because then it can't have... Uh, because purpose, purpose is something that uh, isn't... It's not material, right? It's not something that begins to exist. Purpose is um, sort of brute. Okay. So, so if you the purpose couldn't it be brute. Oh no. <laughs> what? No, what I said is purpose has to be a purpose in virtue of something, right? I didn't say that it has hey, to be said... No 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 no. Look, I think I, I hope someone was recording. Wait, that that is just to that... say it can't be brute. Yeah, and you said <laughs> you were you were saying that it couldn't like you're saying the purpose is brute now, but you said it couldn't be.
And like earlier in the conversation, the explanation he just gave was just saying it can't be brute. He just said that it has to be so in virtue of something. That's just saying it's not. Yeah, brute. exactly. Yeah, exactly. What I'm saying is. But then you can't say it's brute. What? All right. Am, 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 I, am I audible right now? <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Who, who was that? Okay. One of the many people who can hear, I think. All right. Good. Thank. Thank you. So, so I. So sorry. Who was that? Sasha. Sasha. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so, you're saying that the okay. So, if something has self-contained, um, something ha if it has a self-contained purpose, it has to be atemporal. Wait, but do you, it's got him. Do you understand? So, so God is atemporal. God is atemporal. God is wait, atemporal. Then, but God is, does God have thoughts? Yeah, of course. That's what a mind is. Okay. And the thought is like a, sequen uh, a sequence, or sorry, and are they sequential? Yeah. Okay. So how can I a temporal think change? Because time is just a precondition for change, and this is analytic. So how can God be a temporal? He doesn't have thoughts that begin. All of those thoughts are just in chains of uh, sequence. That doesn't mean they begin to exist, right? No, no, no. But if it's sequential, well, one it goes from one state another, from... Right? Yeah. God is just always thinking one really big, complicated thing. So, that's just like, you can't have God be atemporal, because it's like, how will God ever start the universe? Right? Like, causality is a tense notion. I can say it's like, B, the B theory is true, because then the beginning of the universe is like putting things on a like a measuring stick, right? Like things begin to yeah. exist in that sense. But that's not the sense that like the theist means it. It means that there's like literally a first moment. So clearly you can't affirm that like the B theory. No, I I, I affirm the B theory. I deny the A theory. Of oh, interesting. Yeah, but then how... I mean, this is like going really far off the topic, but like how is it that the universe began to exist it's like, you know, maintain the orthodoxic. Uh, oh, just stick with the, the issue of theory. thought of God's thoughts, right? I, he yeah, hasn't. Yeah, I, guess. I, I don't see. I, I don't see the problem with God's thoughts. Well, if they're sequential, yeah. they require time, right? Because the a sequence uh, is why? just like a why? chain what? of. Why? 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 Just like, just like, why? Why? Why do they require time? Okay, efficient? because a sequence goes from one state to another. And that's change. And yeah, change but the, yeah, but that, that, no, 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 no. Just, just a second, just a second. The fact that the, the sequence could just be the um, what's that called? The hierarchy of thought, right? The, in virtue of how, how um, important some thoughts of God are, they don't have to be in virtue of time, right? Yeah, but you so said God that... could have God could God could have multiple th thoughts at the same time, just be giving different hierarchy to them yeah, that's he also just, he just has one big complicated thought is what you're saying right there is no sequence it's just one big complicated thought okay. about everything okay so he has all the thoughts eternally but he gives hierarchical um uh, hi hierarchical um rankings to but, them so to say what so, so that's is, what sash is trying to clarify though is like it, are you trying to say that his thoughts are sequential well, if by sequential that means uh, his thoughts actually begin to exist, no, I don't agree that there is such a thing. But they don't have to begin to exist; they just have to be in relations of before and after. Clearly, they don't need to exist. No, the... no, the, no, there is no such relation. Yeah, okay. he's just always think. Right? Is this what you're yes, saying? Yes. God is just yes. always thinking one huge, complicated thought. Yes, God has always gotcha. been thinking about everything he he will ever think or has ever thought about. But always there is, again, not even a temporal notion. It can't be right. It's not like that thought is being thought over time. Um, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that's supposed to work. I'm there's sure. there's special kinds of thoughts. It is. Sorry, it's just one big thought. No, I no longer believe in uh, that kind of special thing. I, 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 because that has the problem of changing the subject. I, I, I don't believe that, you know, uh, it can be excused by saying that that kind of thing. That's kind of a special thought that we can't understand. I, I, uh, I don't. Well, to a certain degree, I do, but I'm, I'm gonna still provide like an explanation. I'm not gonna say that we can't understand or something. Like that. 
Right if now. God had, if God had sequential thoughts. Yeah, exactly. So I, I still believe that there is analogies by which we can speak. Here's another problem, right? You said that, well, it's not in the sense that God's thoughts begin to exist, but on B the B theory. Yeah, they don't. Begins, but, but but on the B theory, nothing begins to exist. And just right? to, to answer, Andre, um, I don't think they're saying that the problem is God's thoughts being sequential. I think they're saying it's the combination of His thoughts being sequential and atemporal because they're saying se a sequence presupposes time so an atemporal sequence is a contradiction i think that's the thing they're trying to do uh but i think um when people talk about atemporal they're talking about our let's say local presentation of time so if god is outside our local presentation of time doesn't mean that he's not on his own um let's say time scale or time sequence so you don't think okay. he's a temporal? You just think he's a our time temporal? I think he's a temporal with regards to our with our with our existence, and he has his own time scale and however that manifests. And it, and I guess that you could say he he's eternal, but there's still a, a sequence of events that we call time that ex, that exists within his realm of reality, so and it has nothing to do with our our realm. Yeah. So you don't think he's like categorically atemporal you're saying like he's atemporal with respect to our time space but he's in his own whatever then there is time exactly space. yeah but that won't work for cc he's saying that an agent has to be literally atemporal because he's saying that things cannot begin to exist for the agent yeah, CC. Are you saying that? Are you yeah. saying what Concrete's saying? Or are you are you saying God is just straight up atemporal? It's categorically atemporal. There is no time that God is within. Is he in special God time, or is he in no time? Uh, you're muted, CC. He can be. Um temporal in his own realm and have not begun to exist being eternal yeah, so i don't think there's a conflict with eternal no but he's not saying that god began to exist he's saying that god's thoughts couldn't begin to have begun to exist i i don't think he's taking your view cc or cp concrete i guess i don't have to call you cc not as many syllables but he um i don't think he's taking the view that god's in his own kind of like special time like i think he's saying god just is not in time at all like full stop I mean, he can clarify if he wants but he's clearly said that he's outlined that he, he rejected sequential thoughts right he said that this can't take place he agreed to you it's just one big complicated thought that just is eternal like he's he's definitely painting in, in a temporal god here. Like concrete, surely you would agree, given someone's taking that kind of view, that there's a problem, right? Like a sequence presupposes time. God has thoughts, which you know presuppose there being a sequence, but God is completely atemporal, right? Then we get that there is an atemporal sequence, but an atemporal sequence seems like a contradiction. Yeah, it seems to be problematic. Yeah. But I don't see. I don't see a conflict with eternality and being temporal for God. So I don't see, I don't because see why that he would have an issue with that. Been reached. Uh, you're talking yeah. about, we're talking about our local presentation of, um, we're not saying, so you're, you're conflating our, uh, existence and thinking that is eternal with God's existence being eternal. So there was no, definitely, there was God definitely exists. one second, bro. There was definitely a beginning to our existence. So, yeah, we, we are not eternal. No, but the, if there, God exists in eternal time, then an infinite has, would have to be, would have to have been traversed to have reached the present, regardless of if it's our time or if it's God's time. So, uh, see well, an inf well, an infinite cannot be traversed. Why not? Yeah. Well, that's just, just your... It's just analytic from the Pino axioms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope you're moving. Wait, so you, you... Hey, Sasha, are you trolling or are you no, just no, disagreeing? No. I am disagreeing, yeah. I think Malpass has that wrong. Because I saw, like, the conversation and I, I don't think Malpass has that right. Because I know that his objection is that 
for every point, it's going to be a finite distance away. I don't see why there couldn't be a point that's an infinite distance away. And then it's just analytic that you cannot reach that point. Can I say one thing? What, could, it, could, it, could it be non-linear or non-Euclidean time in God's realm? And that would account for the notion that we think it needs to have some sort of linearity and starkness to it? Well, I, also, I, I kind of want to hear Sasha defend that. Avi will probably join forces with you because I, th I think Avi is also tripped out by Alex's view there. Oh. Also, note that this objection carries is just a non starter on V3, right? Which is yeah. what CC is defending. No, but and... I was responding to concrete because he was saying it's like a different type of time for God. It's an eternity past. Uh a different time scale or time what, past. What do you, do, concrete by that? Do you mean when you say eternal there? When you say eternal there, concrete. Are you? But but concrete. When you say eternal, are you saying you mean that God's time is eternal, or are you saying that He's eternal compared to our time, meaning that He would be exist for the entirety of it? He's uh. So I'm just I I can only for that I'm informed by the scripture, right? Scripture says God has always existed. And so I don't know why that would be a conflict for our beginning to have occurred, uh, God having always existed. And I guess Sasha's uh, appealing to infinity, and I don't know. I, I'd have to think about it, but I don't think I don't think infinity uh, comes into play with God deciding to create at any moment during His existence. Well, it, it depends about His time. Like if you're saying God is eternal, there's two times. And God is eternal in his time. You're saying that that time is infinite and God exists for all of it. And now if you're talking about the scripture side, you're saying we exist in this other pocket time that God created. And God existed for the entire time. I think it would be very consistent with the writing of the scriptures to say that uh, they're talking about our time and not God's time when saying God is eternal. So you're, Meaning so you're that, saying... That Go God ahead. Could have had a, meaning under that view, God could have even would not have created, could have maybe not have created himself, or he would have had a beginning and an end, right? In his own time, it just would have been eternal for ours. Eternal for ours, but we haven't existed eternally, so there well, is no eternal it, for ours. When I when I, I so when I'm saying eternal, I'm asking, do you mean exists for all of the all time? Meaning, like, if we're using the word eternal, most of the time we mean it as in something that exists for all available time that we that, that's here, that's our time. No, I if think you're saying eternal something else other than that, then it's not a temporal notion. I think eternal doesn't just speak for our time or the time that, that has passed, but eternal, I think, also speaks into the future, which, will, which is to say always will exist. Always has exist, always will exist. Uh, I think that's what eternal is actually yeah. speaking to all of time like the entire whatever the amounts of time are it's all of that so it right? wouldn't be relative to well, it wouldn't be eternal to relative sorry it wouldn't be eternal relative to our existence because we don't we don't expect to live forever when I said, when we're talking about existence we're talking about this time like god in this other time would exist for all of this time even though it may be limited in his time, right? That's what we're going to add. Watch what you're trying to drill down in here. Because you could still say, you, what you could get yourself into here is say that this other, we're saying that this other time, but really we mean it atemporally. I don't know. I, don't, I, I want to explore what Sasha was talking about. Yeah, I also want to hear about that. Because um, it sounds like Troy and Jack are not agreeing. I think Avi... Is somewhere in the middle maybe oh he left again whatever well no obby but yeah sasha what's what's the issue there oh because um if there is no like what, what malpas was saying is that um you could have a type of infinity where there is like an end right like we are at the end the present moment is at the end that's the last point of that infinite and before that there's an infinite sequence and he's saying that for every point within that sequence, there is um, it's a finite distance away from our point, right? But um, 
I don't see why it couldn't be that there is an infinitely far away point. And the distance between that infinitely far away point and the present couldn't have been traversed. Because for it to have been traversed, um, an infinite would have, like, it would have to be, like, traversing an infinite is analytically impossible. Because um, it's like, if we count the moments that it's traversing, right? Like, let's say we count the days that it's traversing through an infinite. It's going to be like one plus two plus so, right? Um, but the problem is that the successor of every natural number is a natural number. And um, the successor of every natural number is a natural number, right? And like infinity is not a natural number, right? So it's, and the sum of two natural numbers is also always a natural number. Are you saying like, uh, on this concept of time, if there is an infinite amount of time, you're never going to reach the present because yeah. there's an infinite amount of past, right? And then yeah. you're never going to reach the future because there's an infinite amount between the present and the future. I've heard this argument. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the axioms are every natural number has a successor, and the successor of every natural number is a natural number. So it's not like you're going to ever reach like Aleph Null or something. Apply the successor function infinitely many times. Okay. Infinite. Sorry, what? So apply the successor function infinitely many times. I didn't understand what you said. I'm sorry. Just apply the successor function in infinitely many times. Yeah, but isn't that also going to be traversing an infinite? Yeah. I guess I don't understand how it's different then. It's like... I just don't see the issue. I, I don't know. Destroyer, why are you trying to sabotage my argument? Sorry, I'd be saying more, but I'm... What are you playing, Destroyer? <laughs> I'm just plotting to um, sabotage CC's server. Just been praying on his downfall for months now. Why are you doing this? <laughs> I don't like this. Understand the thing about an infinite distance between two points in time. It seems like if you just look at the sequence of natural numbers, right, and assign each one of those as marking some interval, some regular interval, like a second or a minute or whatever, then it's always going to be a finite distance between any two numbers that you pick in the infinite sequence. But that doesn't so how... mean that it's not an infinite sequence. <laughs> right. No, 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 the sequence is infinite. The exactly. sequence of natural numbers is infinite, right? Malpass was saying, look, if you're counting down to zero from every point to the present, there's always a finite distance. Right. If, if you're counting back, if you've been counting infinitely to the present, present is, let's say, uh, zero, you've been counting down infinitely to zero, right? At any point prior to the present, there's a finite distance that has to be traversed, right? And, Sa and Sasha was saying, no, I think there can be an infinite distance between <clears throat> uh, the present and any and some point in the past right but see that i'm not actually understanding because if you take the series of integers starting with zero right any number that you pick is going to be a, a finite number of numbers from zero finite number of integers from zero right and so if you assign each one of those 
numbers as marking an interval of time, like a second or a minute, it's going to follow by analogy, right, that every point in time uh, is going to be, every point in time before the present is a finite distance from the present, right? Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand why Sasha is saying that it can be an infinite distance. Because you're picking a point, right? Any point that you pick before the present, you can, you can mark, you can just see it as as a number from above zero, right? Marking intervals like seconds. So that's just gonna always be a finite distance. Why is he saying it can be an infinite distance? Or she rather, I'm sorry, I always misgender Sasha because Sasha has a, a deep voice. And because the name Sasha is often applied to men. Do you understand that? No, and it also wasn't quite clear to me. Okay, let's grant um, that there's some infinite that's traversed. I, I mean, I guess there's something unintuitive about it, but I just don't like what. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, well, go. Alex wasn't saying that it isn't the case that on a theory. Um, it's necessarily the case that an infinite can be traversed. He's just saying that when they try to make, I don't know if you watched the little discussion that he had with Isaac and me about it, that Isaac uploaded. But what he said was, um, he says that they make a, they typically make a mistake, right? By thinking that the fact that you can't count upwards from zero and reach an end, means that there's that that shows that you can't count backwards to zero right and what he said is that if so that that type of attempt to make the argument by symmetry is just fallacious and so if they want to make an argument that you can't count you can't have an infinite countdown to a finite you know point like zero um, you need an independent argument to establish that. So maybe there could be an argument, but the argument that they've given is, is actually based on a disanalogy. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the argument. I certainly do understand the intuition. But, um, because it's unintuitive to me, you know, and that's why I usually say, well, maybe that's a problem, but it's just not a problem on B theory or C right. theory. <laughs> right. It might be a problem on A theory. But it's not clear that it is, right? Like, they're just basically appealing to an intuition. It doesn't seem like the argument they've given is sound. Right, that's, that's what was my concern then. I think Sasha's, it seems to me Sasha's making some kind of mistake. This point about how there could be an infinite distance between, there could be an infinite distance between zero and some point uh, prior, uh, some point on the, timeline prior if you're counting down to zero yeah. well yeah Sasha what, like, what do you th oh sorry sure you're fine no, it's fine. well I just want to hear what Sasha thinks about the things that Troy and Jack have said um I think, um, like right now, I, I don't think I have a good objection to what they're saying. Like initially, I thought the problem is that, 
like there could be an infinitely um, far away point, but it being put like that, uh, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. I know that there's this framing Avi tries to use where he tries to say, if say that they ha that there is some being who's always existed and they've been putting a ball into a box, you know, one time every, you know, some time increment, like every hour or something like that. And the question is like at time zero, like, well, not, I guess, let's just say at today, like how many balls are in the box? Infinitely many, assuming the balls. Uh, yeah. So, continue to exist. so an infinite amount can be put into the box, but then if we go backwards in time, um, there will always have been an infinite. Sorry? There will always have been an infinite in the box. Right. So you can take it, put an infinite amount in, but you can't take an infinite amount out. Um, I don't really know how he tries to make this work exactly. Yeah, I guess he tries to give some criticisms using something like that. Doesn't it seem like <clears throat> arguments are made in this fashion? Like they are starting from some kind of like time instead of the present when they're talking about this. Like Jack outlined this saying, hey, we're in present. This is zero. And you can count to a point ahead and you can count to a point behind in the sequence of events. And that won't be... Uh, that will be finite. And the opposite of this argument is they're kind of arguing for this concept of there an infinite amount of time, but there's some kind of beginning that they started with. Like how would it? How would have it? They're not starting from the beginning. No, well they're well they 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 think that time has a beginning, right? They're trying to argue against the possibility of the universe having an infinitely long past. In other words, prior to the present, right? They're trying to say that that's conceptually impossible in some way. And the intuition is that if you... That, that there's an infinite expanse of time that has to be crossed, right? Um, in order to get to the present. And they're saying, look, if you had to cross an infinite expanse, you'd never get to the end. That's what it means for it to be infinite, that it has no end. You'd never get to the present. Right? So that's sort of like the Matt Slick, William Lane Craig type of of objection. But but it's not actually clear that there's a real argument there, so much as an intuition. How but how much time has passed though? An infinite, uh, infinite. If if the universe is past infinite, right, the claim would be that an infinite amount of time has passed, because the sequence. Think of it. You, you remember Alex's analogy, right? So think of it as counting down to zero from infinity. Mm -hmm. So, all the 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 set of natural numbers, a set of integers, let's say, from zero to infinity right is an infinite set right if you start counting from zero you'll get an infinite you'll you'll have an infinite there'll be no end to the um count right the count will go on infinitely mm -hmm. so what he's the, what's being imagined is that you've always been counting down to zero before you get to zero mm -hmm. that's sort of the model of i mean for those who want to say that the universe can be past infinite. That's sort of like the model of how, how it would work. So, that we've always been, we've, we've counted an infinite amount of time. Uh, there's an infinite amount of time precedes the present as though we've always been counting prior to zero. So an infinite amount of time on this view has occurred, but we haven't crossed an infinite amount of time. Doesn't that seem kind of... Well, no, I think I think they want to say that an infinite amount of time has been crossed, right? They're, what they're, what what people who are defending the idea of the universe being 
possibly past infinite are saying is that it is possible, right. let's say on A theory, to traverse an infinite expanse of time. Right, but but you're, just to be clear, you're saying, you th you think it makes sense to say that an infinite amount of time has elapsed, but we haven't crossed an infinite amount of time. No, I think you can say we've, I, well, I think that if, if I thought that actual, a, a past infinite universe is possible, I mean, I'm agnostic about this, right, uh, mm -hmm. on a theory, um, then what I would say is that an infinite expanse of time has been crossed. Because so if you were to say, what is the expanse between having counted always uh, downwards to zero, that's an infinite expanse, right? The length between zero and infinity is an infinite expanse, counting forwards. Yeah. So it's also an infinite expanse counting backwards. It's just that it's a, it's an infinite expanse that reaches a finite point. But the set is infinitely large. It's a, you know, it's a countable infinity. So when we talk about, um, when you make this point, this is kind of what fucks with me. This point about from, from any point in the past, there's a finite distance to the present. I understand that, but the, the force of that isn't actually to say that we haven't crossed an infinite amount of um, time. No, they are saying that we've crossed an infinite amount of time. Well, this is what, an what people like, what people are, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood Isaac's question. What people like Craig and Matt Slick and so on want to say is that you can't cross an infinite expanse of time. Therefore, the universe can't be past infinite. But, and and what, it... what Detroyer is objecting is, well, Detroyer is just saying, well, why can't you? Well, yeah, I understand yeah. Troy's objection, just saying, why can't, why can't you have crossed the infinite expanse? So I'm trying to understand what yeah. Alex is saying here, because isn't the Alex response to say you don't need Alex to have crossed an infinite that... expanse? Because there's always a finite distance? No, no. He's saying you can cross an infinite expanse. He's not saying you can't cross an infinite expanse. He's just saying that when they say that, um, he's, he's saying something like, when you say that you can't cross, when they say you can't cross an infinite expanse, right, they're not understanding that um, from any time in the past, um, to the present, it's a finite distance that has to be traversed. And that's going to be true of every point. Um, that's going to be true of every point along the infinite timeline. But why would they even have to be saying that you've crossed an infinite expanse between some finite place in the past and now? Why can't they just refer to the whole sequence of past events? Yeah, but what Alex is objecting is, look, pick any, to any point along the infinite sequence of integers, right? It's going to be a finite distance um, that has to be crossed, and your objection will fail, right? So then pick the one above, pick, pick the point prior to that. Or the one prior to that. Every point that you pick will be a finite distance. Sorry, which, right? which specific objection fails because of this? Well, they're just sort of making a claim that the universe can't be passed. You can't traverse an infinite distance. And, okay, the claim is you can't traverse an infinite distance. And the claim fails for... What's, what's the Alex response to that? Alex is saying, look, pick any point prior to the present in a past infinite universe, right? From every point that you pick, and that's going to include every single point on the timeline, right? Um, there's a finite distance that has to be crossed. Yeah, but how is that responding to the point? Isn't that just, if they're saying you can't cross an infinite because distance... It, it, and... it, because it's kind of, it, that, that objection 
is going to be one that's generalizable to every point on the timeline. But I don't, I don't understand though, because can't they just say, sure, that applies to any point on the timeline, but like how much time has elapsed overall an infinite amount. So we've clearly crossed that. Like, doesn't that kind of like their initial criticism is that you can't cr cross an infinite amount of time. And then the response is to say like, well, any point. Well, he's raising a problem for that claim, right? They're, they're making a claim, which is that an infinite amount expanse of time cannot be crossed, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just saying, well, I don't see why you can't traverse an infinite, because if you pick ev for every point in the infinite set of points that exist prior to the present, there's a finite distance that uh, has to be traversed, right? And that's general. That's that. The fact that there's a finite distance, right, is generalizable to every point on the infinite timeline. And so, given that finite distances can be traversed, right, it seems to it just doesn't seem like there's any reason to think you couldn't all infi count infinitely. You couldn't have an infinite sequence of prior points to the present and arrive at the present. There doesn't seem to be any reason why that couldn't happen, I guess, right? I guess so, just... so they need what he's saying is is they need an independent argument to establish that it can't happen. I think that's what he said. Yeah, because I know. guess I don't understand what work the bit about points in the series being finitely far away from the present is doing like what what advantage does that he's have saying over, he's you know, saying sorry, that just ask this that's what, general what, yes sorry what, no it's fine it's just i don't understand what advantage that has over just saying what's the contradiction that's entailed by saying we've crossed an infinite amount of time oh i see um i don't know what he would say to that but i think he's maybe sort of just sort of offering an explanation for kind of like how it's possible. Hmm. Okay. I, maybe I just need to understand it. But you might want to ask him why he thinks why he thinks that it's important to say that. Because I may have misunderstood um, sort of like what role that plays in the dialectic for him. Yeah, because because where I'm kind of at is. But like... see, for me, it was it was very clarifying, because I had always sort of thought, I I'd always asked people who knew more about you know uh, mathematics, the mathematics of infinity, than I did, to explain to me why they thought that Craig's objection is a bad objection, even on a theory, and I never really felt like I understood sort of like their response but when when alex said this i sort of thought oh well actually now i can see a way in which maybe even on a theory you can cross uh, an actual infinite you know like and overturn the intuition uh that i never sort of had that clarity before yo yeah, so what's going on yo what up venus yeah so you kind of found it like a useful intuition pump basically yeah, I guess where I'm at yeah. is I have this very, like, crude understanding. Like, I, I, where I'm at is I don't know what contradiction is supposed to be there if we say that we've crossed an infinite amount of time, but I don't understand the role that a lot of the things Alex is talking about are meant to play in the dialectic. Like, I'm not sure I understand exactly the point of the, well, what we were just talking about, unless it's just to be an intuition pump like that. I'm not sure I understand um stuff about future perfect views versus simple future um like I, I get the point he's making which is there won't be a point where you will have counted an infinite amount but you will count an infinite amount i understand what he's saying there but i guess i just don't understand how all those like kind of higher level parts of the dialogue like fit together i'm just kind of kind of get the, the basic idea of like i don't see what the contradiction is supposed to be but also venus now that you're here I bet you can explain what Sasha was trying to explain better. Sasha was trying to give an objection to um, crossing an infinite distance, talking about it being analytically impossible. I assume that all came from you. So do you think you could um, you could maybe spell it out? 
Yeah, I think the idea is just supposed to be something like it's an axiom in number theory that every natural number has a successor as a natural number. And so you can never count down, you can never count all natural numbers. And so you can never count to infinity. That's just the age old rule. Well, another way to present that is just the Aristotelian age old rule that you cannot traverse an infinite. Now that's going to be an analytical truth in number theory. I think that's what Sasha probably was talking about. Another way to put it is you can never construct an actual infinite set um, through successive unions of finite sets. That's another way to put it. Jack or Troy, do either of you guys have anything kind of like in response to what Venus is saying there? Curious what you guys make of that. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I was um, the same thing I said earlier. I just don't see why you can't perform the operation infinitely many times to get the sort of stuff you're looking for. I'm sorry, whether, it's, whether it's constructing an infinite set or you know, counting to infinity, uh, perform the operation infinitely many times. Why is that not possible? Have a, you mean like you have a finite starting point and you could still end up with an infinite? Um, sure. That was the idea. Is the idea supposed to be if you keep adding one Before element, take, this, an take infinite. some uh, integer, right? Some or some natural number, whatever. Apply the successor function to it infinitely many times. Oh yeah, no the the idea is that I think Craig says. That's not possible under the A theory of time because uh, there's like temporal becoming. Mm, I'd have to see how that's shown, but how, like how you get <laughs> that it's not possible. But, all right. One, sec one second, let me actually just look up what Craig says. I don't think it should be. I don't think it should be that difficult. Oh yeah, so I got, so I got the the way Craig presents it. Just let me know which premise you reject, okay? Oh, I'll have to look at it in a second, but sure. Plus, in general, okay? Alright. Uh... Yeah, so it's something gonna be something like this. So I can't look at it for another minute, but give me a minute. Uh, second premise is just supposed to be analytical. No, I agree that the second premise is analytical. All you're saying there is that the naturals are closed under succession. The more tenuous uh, premise is going to be premise one. Well, it's supposed to be. The idea I don't. I don't. I don't see anything wrong here. Like I don't know if I disagree just by looking no, at it. Just something about the first premise, right? This is like supposed to be under the A theory. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah. That's that's what we're. So this is that's like the same issue I have with traversing. Traversing the way that 
um, it's used by many of these individuals is not any kind of mathematical function. It's invoking usually some kind of temporal element. And so that's a very different kind of thing altogether. All right. I mean, this is, so Sasha was just talking about P2. Yeah, so Sa Sasha's correct to assert P2. If, if all that Sasha means is that um, like the real numbers are closed under succession. You don't need all this other junk about sets or anything. It's just like a very simple, like, well-known... Yeah, the result. naturals are closed. I mean, that's just a, a truth of... of um, right, I mean, right. Right, so the usual way that we get to infinities is through things like the extended real line or the serial space, right? So there are ways which um, Malpass suggests we could go about an addition rather than a succession involving a transfinite ordinal to get to an infinity. But I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to be getting at. Well, there are these replies that a beginningless universe. You're cutting well, out. Sorry. The usual reply is to deny the first premise, right? But it sounds like the Troid is trying to deny something like the second premise here. Yeah, so. Well, the idea... Well, no, 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 no. The second premise is stated differently than what I was objecting to. Um, wait, let me go back to it again. Um, I wasn't saying that you can um, unite two finite sets to get an actual infinite. I was just saying that, look, have infinitely many of them conjoined or perform the operation infinitely many times. That's not the same as saying that you're just conjoining two finite sets. But I think they're going to. Troy is talking that's, about the divergence of partial sums. That's unbounded, yeah, but, right? That's what you're yeah, getting at. But I think what they're just going to say is that the, that's fine, but that's not how. That's inconsistent with premise one. That's not how the collection of past events right. is precisely. formed. Yeah, precisely. Right. It's like I mean, one at a time is added. Yeah, even even if we were to rephrase one to be talking about. Um, a divergent series of partial sums. It's unlikely that that would be in any way relatable to how most people think about time or causality or whatever. Right. Um, so is one, let's see. So Venus thinks one hinges on the A theory. Yeah, but is, is one follow from the A theory? No, 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 no. One is false. I think one is. I think the problem is that usually people, when they run this argument, fuck, why do I keep typing the letter P? Yeah, when people run this argument, they're confusing uh, an inf. Uh, so there, there are two types of universes that have an infinite past. There can be one that has a starting point that is like infinitely far away. And then it could be like a beginningless universe that doesn't have a first member, right? And I think that distinction isn't really made by people who are on this argument because it, it's the first. Pre it's going to be true that if you have a infinite past that has a first member, then it would be the case that the set of past events would be a collection formed by successive union of finite sets. But if right. you have a beginningless universe, then it's not the case that the set of past events is formed by successive union. Actually, the set of past events always exists. Right? Yeah. Um... And from every point in the past, it's always infinite. Right. Right. Like this, this idea of building up like a set or something, right? Um, from smaller sets is like seems to presuppose that you're starting with nothing or you're starting with one set or a finite yeah, precisely. set and then adding more sets to that precisely. but if you yeah. always have an infinite set then sure you can always keep adding by success exactly. more finite yeah, right. sets right 
surely Craig has some response to that, though. Doesn't he? Yeah, his reply is his reply is the one with uh, the counting man. If you know the thought experiment. Um. Probably heard it, I don't remember. Well, the idea is supposed to be if the universe is beginningless, then imagine a guy who's been counting down all the uh, negative integers, like ordered such that minus one is the last member, right? Um, so he's been counting down the numbers. Is that clear so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've heard this, but yeah, go ahead. Right. And then. The idea is we find the guy right now, right? The guy is like minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, and then he finished. And then why Craig did he says, finish now rather what, than somewhere what, else? What, right, because from every point in the past, in the beginning of the universe, he had sufficient amount of time. And then the right. reply given by, by someone like Paul Draper and Wes Morrison and Noppy is just that it's going to be a brute contingent, contingency that he finishes now as opposed to some other moment. I mean, isn't another reply just to say that this sort of counting down is not even possible? I mean, it doesn't seem... Um, Why well, would it have to be the case that you could... Just, <laughs> um, if the past is infinite in this way, um, that someone who exists at all times could count down from infinity, right? Why? Well, that's a bit tricky because it surely is logically possible, right? So, well, I think it actually is straightforwardly possible. That's just what we mean when a set is countable. And in fact, countably infinite. There's going to be some bijection. So there's going to be, like, if, as long as we're talking about um, like infinite moments, it's still going to be the case that there is a correspondence, right? There's going to be a point in each time where there's a different integer or real or whatever generated by the um, the reduction function. But I, I agree with I, you that I, I think that it's untenable to say that this is the kind of thing that's going on in the real world. I think that's yeah, the even, that I take. Even if we grant that it's, it's countable, yeah, obviously it's countable, yeah, and, and therefore... Maybe it's logically possible. I just don't like. I see. I can understand um, uh, him counting, starting from zero, right? But I don't. Um, maybe I just have this intuition that the count has to start somewhere, where that's that's just being denied or something like that. And you can't start at infinity, or uh, you know what I mean. Well, even so, even if what we're talking about is like some kind of. Um, some kind of case where we start it, you know, somewhere in the, in the infinity. Because if we're talking about, um, like, infinity doesn't have a place in, in the naturals. So we're talking about a divergence, right? So if we're talking about some kind of, like, unrestricted function where you're diverging to infinity, it's still the case that even if it's countable, there's still going to be a bijection. So there's still going to be a point in time each where each uh, like element of the set is like the result of our succession or the result of our reduction. So I don't I don't think that it's logically impossible. Um, sure. I mean, I'm not sure how that was really well, but I mean, like, I guess if all if all we're going to say is sure, if we look at any particular day or whatever on which she's counting, um you'll get some natural number. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You're not going to... There's no day on which you said infinity. Um, yet all the same, the counting is infinite, or goes back infinitely. Is that, there's no problem with that. Is, that. is that what the point is? Right. I don't know. Something still seems unintuitive to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think the reply, if we're talking about like a beginningless universe, is just to the IP one.
But um, I think Maltas was wrong in a video he made with you. Ask yourself. I don't think it's like a symmetrical relation between counting up and counting down. Did you guys, did Brin and Detroit, did you watch the video? No. No, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet, but I did read the, the post where the idea comes from, uh, and I have skimmed over the paper where it's sort of supposed to be sposited a bit better. Uh, it wasn't clear to me um, how he was drawing the asymmetry you're getting at, where counting down involves like a finite point at each, at each like, successive reduction. But did you have like something more in mind about why it's asymmetrical? To me, it just didn't yeah. seem substantiated. All right, Jack, you're there, right? Because Jack thought it was like a genius argument. So I just want to ask, in case I misunderstood, but Malta said from any point in the past, it's going to be a finite distance between that point and the present, right? Yeah, that that was the part where I didn't see support for that, so I wasn't right. I wasn't quite sure. Why can't there Why can't there be a point where he's infinitely far away from the present? Oh, I explained that just oh. a few minutes ago. So the idea is, think about it in terms of actual numbers, right? right. You're counting. So let's say you have a countdown from infinity to zero, right? And then you say that each number actually represents an, in, an interval in some uh, finite, you know, some finite unit. It represents a unit of time, like a second or a minute, right? So <clears throat> pick any point on the timeline. Uh, uh, above zero, right? Okay. And that is going to be a finite distance to zero. to zero and that's going to hold for any number that you pick so you just you just draw the analogy with any point in time and it's always going to be a finite amount of time that has to be crossed between any point in the timeline prior to zero and the present at zero that's why it can't be an infinite expense why does, why pick, does the point... pick any point pick any point right that's yeah. just a number yeah, why does the points have to correspond just... to numbers why can you Shall get some sad right pick... wait Detroit does that sound right to you so I think you know like this math stuff what was the question you had why does the point have to sorry uh, I said. I know. Wait, wait, could you could you just Brian, Could you just explain the point Jack made? I no. did not. I, I did not track it particularly well. So I was hoping that you were going to investigate more, and that I would understand more of what I was trying yeah. to get at. I think it was getting at the same thing I was getting at with Detroit earlier, where um, about like the whole accountability thing, but I, I don't I don't know that that was exactly what I was trying to say, but. He's saying that for any point in the past, it's going to be, it's going to correspond to a natural number. And if that's the right. case, and if that's the case, then it's gonna be a finite distance, but why does it have to correspond to a natural number? Well, that's just sufficient for the well, past, right? Yeah, so that, that I think is, is, is fine. I think, so. I think maybe the idea is that the displacement from, say, now to a previous point in the counting is going to be finite. And then um, despite that, that just generates a function that's unbounded and so it goes to infinity. I'd have to think more about how that would model out. I, I think that maybe it works, but... Um, I'm not totally sold yet. Hopefully, Jack comes back. I'm not. I'm not sure that like I'm picking out a problem. I just like wasn't sure that I totally followed what he said either. Imagine 
Imagine if the past is beginningless. Why isn't there a point in the past that is infinitely far away from the present? Right. Well, that just that just is how it is, right? It's just an unbounded function. So imagine it's not, it's not even particularly meaningful to say that there is a displacement from um, from now and to back to the the unbounded past. This is not even like a defined concept in my view. So you're saying that there's some issue with like half open sets that are. There can't be a half open set that is infinite. I think it makes sense on, under something like an extended or surreal notion. But then your displacement just is, you know, going to be negative infinity or whatever. But I'm, I'm, still, I'm still not quite sure that, like, I understand what, what Jack is trying to say. I think putting it in set theory understandings too is all just like extra pointless verbiage i'm not quite sure why people are holding to it so strongly yeah i think i think there's something I think there's something wrong because, but I want to be corrected though. Sorry, well, sorry. I can, I can try explaining it now. Right. Um, so the idea is we're talking about infinite expanse of time, right? And that time, it, the, that time is, um, can be represented as like an infinite set of seconds. An infinite set of minutes, yeah, that's, or something that's, like that. Yeah, that's what I'm disputing. Because I'm saying if the if the past is beginningless, then it can't be represented as a bounded set whose cardinality is, you know, alpha null. Right. So that is incorrect. Well, if you don't think if you don't think that uh, that time has if you don't think that an infinite past is an infinite number of seconds then I don't think I don't think I have anything to say to that I don't know what Alex would say but if you think that it's an infinite number of seconds right, then you're just you going to be able to so I go ahead are you thinking that it has like some higher card now like what is the yeah, that's the part I don't understand. Uh, so I think Bryn is tracking what I'm saying. I'm saying if I'm saying that if the past is beginningless, then there is no first moment, right? We're not and saying so, there's a first moment. We're saying that the set of seconds prior to the to the present. If the past is past infinite, is an infinite set is a set of infinite size. There's an infinite number of seconds. Yeah, it's like you're speaking as though this <laughs> account is like somehow incompatible with your the beginning of this past, but why would it be? I don't think that it has to be. So I think it's I think it's easy enough for them to just say. Um, and it, it actually seems relatively intuitive, but I, I think I'm trying to understand uh, charitably what Venus is getting at more than I, I think that it actually is getting at the truth. I think that the point is with Jack is just that it is a countably infinite set. We don't have to use seconds. We can just use whatever like basic unit. We don't have to get caught up in any of that. And I, all, all, you have to, all you have to understand with Jack's is just that um, the past can be... Uh, Modeled as a like a countable infinity. Also, I don't. Uh, is this an open discussion or no? I, yeah, if you if you have something to, to contribute, go ahead. I was just gonna say, just because something is, is infinite, also, I was gonna say that doesn't mean that it follows that it doesn't have a beginning either. Right. 
Yeah, I think I think the problem is. But I don't know. Well, I, just just respond to that guy quick. Where we've well, we've already made that distinction. We're talking about a particular kind of infinity that. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm. I'm has, has an, has, so we're talking about. So imagine the inverse of like the successor function. So you have like a reducer function. So you're going one down in the chain. The idea is that the past is best modeled as like a continual application of the reduction function, and that that is an unbounded uh, function. So it, it unboundedly goes towards like negative infinity or a you know unbounded past. So it has an infinite right. past. There's gotcha. no beginning. Yeah. We're not talking about you know the the countable set of you know infinites from zero to infinity. It's a it's a different thing. Yeah. Well those no because the so what I'm looking at is if the universe is beginningless, right, then there is a point that's infinitely that uh, from now to that point there's an infinite distance and that point being in the past. And I'm asking, why couldn't the guy who's counting down be at that point? And in that case, he wouldn't have a finite uh, numbers of counting down. Right. He would. He would. He would not if he was. But again, I think it's actually just like a category error to say that he's at that point. What uh, being at the infinite in like an extended real means is that you are uh, talking about this kind of limit of the partial sums. I don't think that it really, I mean, so on the extended reals, it's a point, but it, it's not clear how that would model against something like time. You know, it's not it's sort of unclear how you would be at a point in time like that. No, I don't see. One second, I got to rejoin. Yeah, I don't see the Jack, do you see an issue with that? Here with me. I said, if the uni if the if the past is beginningless, then there is a point whose distance from the present is infinite. And no, not, not, in the, not in the way, not in the way that I, not in the way that I'm presenting. Right? Because what I'm saying is, <clears throat> if the universe is past infinite, right? That means that the set of seconds um, that constitutes the number of seconds um, prior to the present is a countably infinite set. And therefore, it can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of integers counting up from zero, right? Set of positive integers counting up from zero, right? And so then if you pick any point in time prior to the present, any point along that infinite timeline, that's going to be a finite number larger than zero. That's why there can't be an infinite distance between um, zero or between the, the present and any point in the past. Just like there can't be an infinite distance between, there can't be an infinite number of integers between zero and any integer larger than zero. Yeah, because any any point you pick out is going to be a natural number. Exactly. Yeah, I get that point. That's the objection I was making to what Sasha said. So Sasha was saying he thought Malpass was wrong. He didn't see why there couldn't be an infinite distance between the present and any point in the past, right? And I was saying if you look at it in terms of a one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers, you can see why every um, point prior to the present is going to be a finite distance from the present. That's a good point. Um, all I'm saying is I think there's, a, I think there's an issue in saying that the past can be presented as an infinite set that is bounded. Well, see, but I think that's where, why I'm, I'm sort of like thinking the way Detroyer is. 
Because if you deny that there's an a set, a countably large, infinite set of seconds prior to the present, it just seems like what you're saying is, is that it's uncountable. And I don't really understand that. Well, countable, I assume you mean it can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence yeah. with a set of natural numbers, yeah, right? Yeah, because for every second, every second prior to the present, I can add, you know, whatever, minus one, second before that, minus two, and it'll never end, and, but, it, but it will just be the set of negative integers, like this, right, which is a countably infinite set. You you wanna you wanna deny that, right? But I see I don't understand how you deny that if you just say, Well look, there's a second prior to the present. There could be a second prior to that, and there could be a second prior to that, and I just assign an integer to each one of those seconds. I'll just have the set of negative integers and they'll never be I'll never reach the end of counting, just like I'll never reach the end of the second. Then you're gonna you're gonna correspond the present with number one, right? Yeah, or zero or whatever. Yeah. I think that sort of like flips the type of set that beginningless universe is. Because in that case you're talking about something that has a first member but doesn't have a last member. What is a beginningless universe supposed to have no first member, but the last member being the present? No, it doesn't have to have either. Or it doesn't have to have. Oh, I mean, like we can arbitrarily assign the present as the last member. So I think what Sasha was disputing um, was merely that the past can be put into one to one correspondence or is countable. Yeah, he's just saying that it's not countable. Right. If it had... yeah, see, I don't see a good reason to think it's not countable, right? Because all you're doing is saying there's a second prior to the present and that if you were to keep counting backwards by se second by second from the present, right? Um, there's no logical bar to having an infinite series prior to the present, right? And that's going to be, if you think about that as numbered, that's going to be a countably, countably infinite. That's going to be the countably infinite set of negative integers. So why would somebody, how would somebody object to that? I don't get it. It seems like Detroyer is right. If they're just saying that you can't represent it that way, it sounds like they're saying it's like um, it's a non-countable. <laughs> but why would they say that? Why would they say? I mean, just think about it the other. Think about it the other way, right? Like use the Morrison Malpass move of turning it forward, right? You obviously, I can say there's a second from now, I mean, and certainly Craig is not going to want to deny this, right? There's a second from now that could be had. I mean, there's a second that's going to happen from now, and there's going to be one after that, and one after that, and so if I you know, obviously that extends infinitely um, in the future, but surely Craig is going to agree that that set, right, is a, is a countable infinity, the set of positive integers. If we take zero, uh, if we take the present as zero or one, right, we're just going to get the set of positive integers as the size of that set of seconds. Right, it's an infinite set, set of infinite size, um, but it's countable. Why would it be different for the past? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason to think that time is an uncountable. 
obviously, if you start dividing up the set of points, um, you can represent the, the line as uncountable, right? But that's yeah, not right. going to apply to the set of seconds, right? Right. It won't. It won't apply to anything where we have a basic unit of time. Exactly. Like you can do the Zeno thing, right? And just yeah. But that's not what's at issue here. What's at issue here is how many seconds there are prior to the present, and that's accountably infinite seconds. I mean, if the universe is past infinite, that would be accountably infinite set. So the thing is, when you say the past is infinite, I'm saying it can be infinite in two ways, right? You can have some infinitely far away starting point. And if that's the case, um, I think your objection goes through. But it can also be that it's beginningless. And I think the difference between those two no, but we're agreeing is... That it's beginningless. Right, obviously. That's the view that we're discussing. Yeah, but isn't, isn't, it, isn't if, if it's countable, isn't it going to be a bounded set? No. Because the set of real numbers is bigger than the set of natural numbers, right? True. That's right. No. A, no. There's a... There's definitely a way you can model the past such that it is not a bounded function. And I, I think that's just like trivially what Jack described, the view that the past is just some reducer function with a uh, basic unit of time. That function just is unboundedly decreasing towards uh, negative infinity. But the point is, what would Craig say if we asked him, right? Is there a set? What, what is the size of the set of seconds? Um, or what will the size be, right, of the set of seconds from the... Well, if you ask it that way, what future. will the size be? He's always going to say it's, it's finite. But there's, there's got to be a way to put it in language that he would not resist, right? Because he, he, he will agree that there's that the there's like, can, can well, you if you ask him like how many it, seconds are like yet to pass or something? Yes. He'll say it's accountably many. infinite set, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's my point. So if he's going to grant that the, the set is accountably infinite set with respect to the future, what is the logical bar to a set of equal size prior to the present? Yeah, I don't know. But that's my point. My point is he can't resort to like some claim that it's an uncountable infinite, right? I don't think if Craig he's grant... No, no, I'm not saying he doesn't, okay, yeah. right? But I'm just saying like, how is he going to resist, um, you know, how is, he, how is he going to try to argue that there's any symmetry there? You can't make the move that it's like, uncount, it's not countable infinity or something like that. That would just be bizarre, right? If he's granting that it's a countable infinity forward, then how is he going to say it would, you know, it it, if it were to go backwards, it would have to be uncountable. You see what I'm getting at? No, no, I agree. Um, Craig has said some things about what he thinks the asymmetry is. Um, well, it was something you, like, well, because the past events exist in some sense, or uh, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> that seems that seems like totally said, uncountable. He says he right. says that the past is part of the present, whereas the future isn't. Uh, but I don't know what he means by that. Yeah, but, what, is, um, what does that mean? That doesn't. Right. <laughs> that, that sounds yeah, like gibberish. But um, 
Jack, would I would understand your objection to be something like if it's countable, then any 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 moment in the past is going to correspond to some natural number, and that just means that the distance from that to the present is going to be finite, and that's going to be that's the case correct. for every point. But if that's it's going to be generalizable not, to every point. But if it's not countable, then that's going to require some kind of uh, justification or something. Yes. Right. That's, that's certainly not how there required. Could be any for... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say. It seems implausible, but certainly it's not required for it to be infinite past that it's uncountably so. Right. Because especially since it seems so clear that if you ask them what's the size of the set of seconds that is yet to pass, they're going to agree that that set is countable. Who's going to resist that? Like, that's going to be a very wacky move for them to make, right? I might be out of my death, and feel free to tell me if I am. But it sounds like when you make this sort of um, division that you're not talking about the same thing anymore. Because the whole point is that what's the beginning of the infinite past, right? And so when you take an arbitrary number, you've reduced it to non-infinite. And so you can say, well, yeah, this is countable, but you're missing the infinite part of the argument. Yeah, that's... That's why I'd be interested in poking holes at this. I think what we would want to do is get into notions of measure. Um, because what we were talking about were intervals. The question is whether or not um, whether or not there is a meaningful measure that is finite from now to the past, where the past is de uh, defined unboundedly. I think that there might be a problem there. Um, but there's sort of like this this way in which there isn't a problem, which is what, what uh, Jack is getting at, and uh, which I was trying to get at earlier with the accountability and the bijection onto onto the numbers. It, it just is the case that so long as you understand the counting series where uh, there's a moment in time theoretically where each in each element of an infinite set maps onto it, then there's there's no issue at all. That that counting function is occurring, and there's a point in time where we're at like some, you know, finite determinate point for every element. It's all fine. the The weirder question, I think, is whether whether this whole thing with measure is gonna is gonna make much sense. But I don't have an objection like uh, right now. I don't. I'm just saying that I think that maybe would be the route that they would want to go. The idea that there's an asymmetry in the in what cons well, in what the present consists in is ridiculous uh, the future is could be understand like uh, almost counterfactually although there's probably a better term for it versus how the, the past is understood Telling me that Trump tried to give a press conference at a Four Seasons hotel. Yep. And they they didn't grant him permission, so he did it in the parking lot of a landscaping store. It's even no, thought, it's even it's no, even no, worse no, than that, they Jack. They missed book. They booked the wrong place. Yeah, they actually made a mistake and then didn't correct it. They said they booked it explicitly because it was an exit Suburban off of I-95. So he gave a press conference from a parking lot of a suburban right. landscaping store. <laughs> yeah, you can you can actually see photos of it. They just put a bunch of like Trump signs. They like taped them to the garage door for the landscaping company, and then put the podium in front of it. This <laughs> is. <laughs> I, I don't know if we were done with the time thing, but I think Craig does have a reply to the um, in the context of beginning assumes because I know the discussion with those um, those hijab and the other guy wasn't about like whether the universe had a beginning, but um, Craig does have a reply to. 
even if you make the point about from every point in the past, it's going to be a finite distance from that point to the present. Because G.L. Mackey makes a similar point in his book, The Miracle of Theism. So it wasn't so, something novel with Malpass, but, um, but um, his reply is going to be something like, If the universe is beginningless, then there is no first event. And if it's the case that an event can only occur if the event before it has occurred, then there is a first event. It is the case that an event can only occur if the event before it has occurred. Um, therefore, there is a first event, and therefore the universe is a beginning. But that's how it responds. I don't know if you find that interesting or not. It's the same. It's just, it's just another sort of. It's a sort of contingency thing, right? That I'm just going to say that. Yeah. So, like, so my worry is that if what we're talking about is things like displacement, distance, uh, etc. The notion that that corresponds to in mathematics is measure. Um, if we're talking about an interval from a bounded to an unbounded, the outer measure just is uh, the infinite point on the extended reals. So Sorry. it's so it's weird. It's weird for me to su to suggest that what we're getting, um, given we're trying to quantify measure to this like infinite past would be finite. I don't know how to go about doing that. I agree that there's going to be a finite measure um, from any from any like <clears throat> um, finite start to any point in the past, but. The interval is defined functionally as being unbounded, and in that case, it is a the measure is infinite. What I was going to say was, um, I have to look at that argument. But why, why wouldn't someone just say, or couldn't someone just say, yeah, the um, occurrence of some event depends on an event prior to that, and so on back towards infinity. Right? But all the events occurred, and so they. I mean, what's the issue? What was the premise that, that required there to be some first event? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I, I don't see any reason to, to be worried about that. Craig Cutting out on me. The push is being annoying. Yeah, it says something like, uh, so just think of the sniper example or whatever, like the Burger King example or whatever. You know, those like, you can get the torch now if the guy before you didn't give you the torch, but he can get the torch before, right? right? right. Think of those cases. Right, so Craig says, sort of like the process couldn't begin, um, the process couldn't begin if there wasn't the first person. And another way is that why is that why is that a problem? But, so like, that's his you, yeah, but I don't see I why don't that. See why is, why yeah, why why is that a problem? Because the view, if he's if he's saying the problem is the process couldn't begin, well, yeah, that's the view. The view is that the process didn't begin. The past is it, the past is infinite. That's just restating the view that you're trying to reply to. Uh. No, I'm just saying what Craig replies with. I'm not saying it's a successful reply. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I mean, what he's saying is, as long as the process is going on now, that could only be the case if there was a first beginning. Because... But I think there's like some circularity in that reasoning. Yeah, I don't see how that argument goes there either. Like, I, I, think I don't it, see... I, yeah. yeah, it's circular in it. I think it involves a rather tenuous understanding of what a process is. I mean, there are notions of process which are not going to be defined that utilize like some kind of um, causality or 
utilize some kind of temporality, even though that's how we typically think about them. There can just be ways to think about processes such that we just are talking about um, like functions with determinate outcomes. So there's no there's no reason to think that um, that that's necessary. Like I think that that just gets into memes about the different notions of time between like A, B, uh, like subtypes of B, etc. I think the key point is that for any, even if it's the case that for any moment that exists requires some prior moment, it doesn't follow from that that there needs to be a first moment. Right. That's, the opposite that's, that's, follows. That's exactly right? right. The opposite follows. If yeah, every exactly moment requires follows. a moment, then you're just saying, you're just describing an infinite set. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Or it's sequence. Not, no, it's not that. Well, I think it's supposed to be construed that every moment that has a present moment could only take place if the present moment before it took place. But that doesn't exclude that there could be a first moment. That's what Craig is saying. Yeah. But I, th it I doesn't, think all it doesn't of doesn't enforce the inclusion of it either. Right. I mean, all of this goes back to the issue that I raised in the beginning, which was that I think all of these arguments, all of these like traversing the infinite arguments, make the mistake of confusing a beginningless universe, uh, which which by definition doesn't have a starting point, uh, with like some kind of a of infinite past that does have a beginning point, and so to just say that to just say that the process had to start is just to beg the question against the beginningless universe. I think that's all it boils down to. Right, right. Um, the other point is that I. I... I, I with with Malpass was saying, I think I appreciate the the asymmetry of like the contradiction now because like if someone says, um, when they're talking about counting up to infinity, like I can I can easily see how that entails a contradiction because you can't complete that process because it is it is not the case that it infinite ends. Um, I can see a contradiction there, but I can't see a contradiction if someone has always been counting to the present moment and completes the task of counting to the. I just don't see the contradiction if someone completes that task. Because the, the end point is not, no one has ever said the end point would be infinite. The end point is clearly finite. And so if one completes the task of counting, even if they have traversed an infinite, um, it doesn't seem to be that there's a clear contradiction with that traversal of an infinite if they're counting down rather than if they're counting up. I think okay, so, so here's so here's here's like the problem understood mathematically. Um, if what we're talking about is that we're starting from the point on the extended reals that is negative infinity, there's no definition um, of the successor function that ever results in anything but an infinity. Um, and then another way to put it just is the measure point, which is that there so long as the interval from a bounded a to an unbounded B uh, is what we're measuring, the measure for that is necessarily infinite. Uh, so it, it's the point is, is that there's very little reason to think that you could actually finish that countdown. So it's just sort of like asserting something that is impossible. And if, you're no. starting, if you're starting from infinity, there is on the real well, you're extended not starting, line. Well, when you say starting from infinity, like is that, are you saying that there is a, there's a point that this individual started from? So that's that's the question: Is are we talking about a view where infinity is understood as a point, or are we talking about the view where infinity no, is understood just, as a boundless function? Yeah, it's it's boundless. It's just that the individual has always been counting down. Okay, so but the then, individual but has then, always then, been counting down. Yeah. yeah, but then then the problem is there is no there's no um, there's no outcome on the successor function from that boundless function. Um, that results in a non-infinity. So there's never there's never a meaningful way in which you've begun the countdown. That's fine. You're getting that's into the, the finites. But that's the view. The view is that there is never a point at which the individual can count down because he's always been counting down. That's just restating the view. Yeah, this, so this, I, 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 I understand. I understand the bijection thing. That was what uh, I was getting at with the Troyer, and then that Jack got up with too. The the issue is whether or not we are supposed to be talking about is whether or not there is a bijection between um, 
this set of counted numbers and the naturals, or if what we're talking about is the result of uh, successive reduction on negative infinity on the extended you're reals. Gonna have to un you're going to have to unpack all that for me. So just, well, 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 let me just ask you this. Do you think there's a problem? Do you think there's a um, reason to believe that an individual could not count, uh, could not complete a countdown if they have always been counting down? No, because I think that that is the bijection. So that is all that that is saying is that um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence um, between the numbers that have been counted and the and like in Jack's case, he he points out that it would be the negative integers, but you don't even necessarily have to use that. Yeah. Okay. So that yeah. So the, and you do agree that there is a problem with completing the task of a count up. Well, so this is right? yeah, so th yeah, so yeah, that's that's the weirdness is um, technically there's a sense in which you could complete the count up if what you're talking about is the bijection, well, the injection, I guess, of the set of counted or to be counted numbers and um, the positive integers. Well, in let case, me ask you this: Is there ever a point in which the individual um, will have completed? Is there ever a no. point in which these, yeah, there isn't. Okay. No, and so the, and so the, um, yeah, no, I don't think so. The question, the and question is, there, I, and is there ever a point, and, and mirror that, is there ever a point in which the individual will have completed the countdown? The answer is yes. So there's an asymmetry there. The the issue is in, I guess, what is meant by um, by completed. How can you count down if there's no starting point? Well, right. So that, that's 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 well, that, 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 that's that's my point. Well, uh, that's my point. Is that the, the measure is infinite? There's no starting point because well, the measure is the infinite. There, yeah. There's no so reduction on reduction on negative infinity just is definitionally negative infinity. There's no, there's no, so basically you're, you're taking a function that is unboundedly going towards negative infinity. And the question is, is what does the reducer function or just a subtraction by one, what does that result? And the, the point is, is that in the extended reals, it's always negative infinity. Unless, yeah, so unless, the... unless what we're talking about is the subtraction of a transfinite or the subtraction of an actual infinite, the, Former could get you on, I guess, Malpass's view, um, a finite, and then the subtraction of two infinities is an undefined. Yeah, subtraction of transfinite numbers is undefined, right? So it's like division. Well, so the subtraction of transfinites on Malpass's view is defined. He thinks that it's defined and gives you a finite. I'm not so sure that that's true. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what he's pointing to to think that. But the point is, is that the subtraction of an infinite is undefined, and the subtraction of a uh, finite just Wait. is infinite. Because Can I, I just want to ask: Is there a argument for which an individual can't complete a countdown if they have never begun a countdown, or is this something just that is intuitive? No. Yeah. That, uh, that, no, that, just... that, but that's what Venus and I are saying: is that there's no there's no meaningful sense in which the countdown has begun. What does it mean to count down? something that doesn't have a beginning right I, I i don't know if wait what's what why would we think that it can have a meaning i mean i'm i'm picturing it um there's an individual that's always been counting down and he's so he's never begun to count down however he completes the countdown like why does that not have meaning is it just counterintuitive? I agree it's counterintuitive. The, like if you the, want to say it seems weird as hell, like I agree it seems weird as hell, but so like the if problem, you want to say it's incoherent. The problem in my is, mind is, is it that... incoherent? Well, let me just ask this. Is there a contradiction of some sort? No. So the, the, the problem, I suppose, is that if we think that that is sort of a meaningful thing to describe, then we have this issue where starting at zero and counting into a boundless future, I think also has to be understood as meaningful. In counting into an infinite future is meaningful. Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, because so the the issue is is I think that there's some conflation of what is being well, described is, going well, I on. I just want to hear why that follows. Hold on. So wait, are you saying? I just want to be clear on what you're saying. So are you saying that if we take the view that if an individual has always been counting down and completes the countdown, if we take that as coherent, then we also need to take it as coherence that an individual completes a count up. So long as they are so saying? so long as they are always counting up. This is the important this is the important difference because I think without that notion we're talking about two different things. If we okay, include this so... if if we include this notion that they are always doing something, then what yeah. we are talking about is something like the limit of partial sums or yeah. Whether, yeah, or, I, whether or not it's bijective with a count okay, with cool, the, like cool. a, the naturals. Yeah. Uh, cool. I think... So so I I I I disagree. I'll tell you why I disagree. The reason why I disagree is because even if we include that he's always been counting up, there seems to be an entailed contradiction if he completes the task of counting up to infinity. The contradiction is that the individual has reached the end of something that is by definition endless. And so it that's, is and is not the case. So well, that's, yeah. that's, that's, so that's not true on the extended reals. On the extended reals, the limit of the partial sum of a boundless function towards infinity uh, is defined as the point of infinity. In other uh, words, are you saying that it's defined as an endpoint? That there's a, an, an end the, point the, so, to, for which there will be no yeah, so the, further value? Yeah, so, well, sort of. The, the point is, is that, yeah, there's no... There is no successor on infinity. The succession, the succession on infinity, Wait. just is infinity. I think you're talking past each other. I think Avi's point is something like he can imagine a person for every moment in the past is counting, and he's finishing the count now. Mm -hmm. And that's so, what so, he means. So, by so, 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 Venus, I think that. But yeah, so I that think there will never be a point in the future. In which the guy finishes the count, right? And so, that's so, what he's yeah, yeah, so the, there's some kind of a symmetry break. Yeah, the the problem here is that the way that completeness is understood, I think, almost begs the question. The issue yeah. is that what well, we the way we have to understand completeness in the case of the count up is actually at the beginning. We have to understand so so completeness. If we were actually to map this out, uh, or to model this out mathematically, completeness is that a function has some way in which it can output zero. Um, in the case of addition from zero, then it just is the starting point. And the point is, is if what we're talking about is whether or not the set of numbers we have counted is um, is countably infinite or it's bijective with the naturals or whatever, then the point is, is that it, as long as the person is always counting, then yeah, they, it is the case that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence right. with with an infinite. You're just you're just disputing that that's not a countdown. I'm, so, so my my view is that uh, I have. So my view is that there's a my view is that there's a conflation of two different concepts. On one hand, what we're talking about is whether or not a uh, set is countable, and I think that the my view is that it is both the case that there is backwards infinite countability and forward infinite countability, and then the the next question, uh, sort of what Jack was getting at, is whether or not um, the measure from a bounded side to an unbounded side is non-infinite. And my view is that it, it is infinite. And so my, my view is that there isn't a meaningful way to start counting down just in the same way that there isn't a meaningful way to finish counting up. Wait, so just to be clear, the reason I hold it to the asymmetry is not because I think one side is infinite and the other side is not. I think both sides are a traversal of the infinite. Mm -hmm. It's just that I think one traversal of the infinite seems to entail a clear contradiction, and the other doesn't seem to entail a clear contradiction. I can imagine. So, so, so here's, yeah, so here's, so, one, so here's, so, yeah. So here's, here's the contradiction as sort of the way that um, Craig would put it. So Craig's using success, the successor function. We'll use the reducer function, the inverse of the successor function. So, for example, the reduction on five is four. Um, we're starting with infinite. 
What happens no, when we? What happens not, when we? What, not, what, what, what not, happens when no, we do something? Like you've already begged the question. Yeah. Now you're not talking about something beginningless. Now you're talking about something yeah, that. Yeah. Just started. No, I am. No, I am. No, I am. No, I am. I am talking about something beginningless because I'm talking. So I'm talking about the reduction. How is it starting? Of, I, I, that's my point is I do not think that there is a starting and that the entire point is that there isn't a meaningful reduction on an infinite. Look, what is that? Uh, Avi, I think, I think Avi's point is if we think about a universe that has a starting point, that has a first event, but that event is infinitely far away from the present, that would be symmetrical to uh, the future in which the person starts to count down now. And so both are going to be impossible. But that's not the type of universe he's thinking about. He's thinking about the universe that is beginningless, that doesn't have a starting point. And such a universe, he says, doesn't entail a contradiction like the other one does. That would be right, Avi, right? That's, that's, that's what you have in mind? That's, that's correct. Yeah. And, I agree with, and I agree with Avi. Um, I just think that the latter... I just think that the latter cannot be presented as some kind of a set. I think there's like some kind of conceptual issue there. But it seems like people disagree with me. Hey, can uh, the guy who is going to talk about the inverse of the function please finish? Yeah, so I mean, look, what is, what is the predecessor of infinity or what is the successor of negative infinity? At least within the extended reals, they're just defined as um, infinity and negative infinity, respectively. Yeah, but the point I was making is, at no point in the past will you ever, fi will you ever find the value infinite. Yeah, that's that's fine. I don't I don't have an issue uh, with that. This is what I'm getting at when I think that there is a conflation between two concepts. One of them is we're asking whether or not there is a finite measure. And then the other question is whether or not um, the set of counted numbers is bijective with um, the naturals. And I think that the issue arises between those two things. So in the one case, the uh, countdown is defended by appealing to its countability. And in the other case, the count up is dismayed in virtue of its infinite measure. Do people in here actually know what it means I'm, for a function to be by Jack? Hold on, I think I'm losing my connection. Um, the countdown is defended. I, I just, just I feel like it's, that's it's, worth clearing up though. Like, do people in here actually know what he means? It's just not rejected it? because I don't see a Sorry, contradiction. Am I not coming through? Okay. The count up, I see a contradiction. I hear you. That's all. You are, I don't know if Avi can hear like you. Avi I just can't hear. find a contradiction with the count up. Avi, can you hear Isaac? I don't think he can hear anyone. Uh, but I can find a contradiction There's with no the count yeah. up. Yeah. Someone just disconnect him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying he's, that means uh, that he's, he's a, saying that he's probably connecting it's, to it's the just, server. He'll, yeah, he'll he'll come back, I'm sure. I I mean, there's no way he's talking over literally everyone. That, that certainly. <laughs> Avi, Sorry. Everyone was talking. I don't think you could hear anyone. Oh, I couldn't hear anyone. Um, um, I was I was just saying though, like it's probably worth clearing up what it means for a function to be bijective. Sure. Okay. So bi bijective just means one to one correspondence. So if I have, you what? know, the set what? No, hmm? it doesn't. It's it's yeah. the combination of it for a function to be bijective. It's got to be one to one and onto. Right. Not just one to one. You can have one to oneness without bijection. So like, if you have, so if you have like two sets of numbers or you have like, say you have like the letters in the alphabet and the numbers up to 26 or whatever, if a function is one to one, then there every, um, there, there's, yeah. there's nothing so that map, sorry, there's, there's nothing that maps to more than one element. Everything, everything in the domain maps to precisely one element. That's what it means for it to be one-to-one. -one. Yeah. yeah. So just, just to be clear, I, I thought I said one-to-one -one correspondent. I thought I said one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, wait, sorry. I just, I, I also forget if, if one-to-one -one is that everything in the domain has to map onto one thing or just anything that does map maps onto just one thing. But the point, the point is like, you know, when you have one-to-one, -one, you can't have like 
one and two both, former, yeah. or a and b both map to one or something like that it's like yeah, everything but... can only map to one thing yeah so just just to be clear though i said one-to-one -one correspondence where correspondence is meant to mean on two oh okay yeah uh, all right well yeah so... yeah I, I i i understand the confusion there because uh I could have I could have been more clear and said one to one and on two, but so the one to one correspondence is taken to be one to one with on two. Okay, so yeah, just the point the point is just for something to be bijective. We're saying it's one to one and on two. So right, one, yeah, one to one is is one to one that everything in the domain maps to one element or anything in the domain that maps maps to one element. The former. Yeah, everything in the domain maps to one element, and then uh, on two is everything in the range or in the target yeah the target is the range right it's like everything in the in the target mm -hmm. is is mapped to there's not anything that's say, right say it were yep. like again a function from you know like the a, a b the alphabet through like numbers one to 26 right. if it's right uh if it's on to there's nothing in there's no um there's no number there that doesn't have something that maps to it and a function that's right has an inverse if it's one to one and on to. That's right. And by by objective just means one to one and on to. Right. And then and then earlier Alvi was using the term one to one correspondence, which is as I understand it out of vogue, but is another way to put it. So ten is by objective to ten? Yeah, in a, in a sense. What ten isn't a function, but like if if, if you if you have the set with a single element of ten then yeah. Yeah, if, if if it's two, well, yeah, like you have like two sets and they're both just ten, and ten maps to ten, then it, yeah, it's one to one and on to. It's bijective. Right. And its inverse is the same as it. All right. Cool. Thanks for clearing that up. I'm still not seeing the the problem with um performing i'm not seeing the problem at least not even as with the count up um i see i see what i would consider reductios i see weirdness i see like hilarious entailments i mean i can generate a whole bunch of hypotheticals that show the hilarious entailments of the countdown but i don't see a contradiction um but i do see a contradiction with the count up that's all i'm saying yeah, so my point is that I think if we if we pulled in Craig's argument, so I don't have it on hand, um, but if someone pulls up his syllogism involving the successor function, you could actually do uh, the same <clears throat> for the predecessor function. Um, and in fact, you could do the same for the successor function given the extended reals on, in, on an infinite. It just is the case that on the extended reals, the successor of negative infinity uh, just is negative infinity. In fact, the addition of anything into the negative infinity um, that's finite will be negative infinity. So what's the issue? The issue is, is that um, if there's a sense in which... So, so, uh, so the way that I understand the count-up problem is, is that the... The addition of reals uh, is, or sorry, reals are closed under addition, right? So the idea is just that if I take any two, uh, if I take, well, actually, sorry, we'll just use naturals. If, if we take any two naturals and I add them, um, I get a natural. The uh, infinite is not a natural, so it can never be the case that 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 the addition causes us to get a natural or uh, get an infinite. Sorry, I'm misspeaking a bunch. The same problem occurs, I think. If what we understand the count up to be is um, sorry, do you mean count down to be? Um, the so count so yeah so so I so I guess I'm, I'm getting even more confused because the way that we were understanding time was that it was um, it was counting up from negative infinity, which just would be the same as counting down from positive infinity. The, those are just those are just the same in a sense. The same, so the same thing could just be said of the predecessor on infinity. The predecessor so, of infinity just is infinity. So, come back to the same issue that I keep having. 
the issue I keep having is it's very clear to me what the contradiction is in the count up. If someone performs a count up, it's very clear to me what that contradiction is. If someone performs a countdown, it's highly unclear to me what the contradiction is. So, do you ha- can you clarify what the contradiction is? Yeah. So, is so, so, so what? Problem that's yeah. So, so what I was suggesting is that we pull up uh, Craig's argument and we can swap out the relevant features of it for uh, the predecession on infinity. But just before we do that, is Craig trying to establish that there is a contradiction in the countdown? Yeah, yeah, he would be okay. trying to do that. Okay. And what? And does Craig specify what propositions form the contradiction in the countdown? He he does not. the The point is is that I think that you could, um, that he could do something like this. Okay. But so okay. so 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 as I understand it, the the issue is that Craig doesn't actually make a distinction. The distinction comes from the paper from uh, Malpass and the other guy. Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm talking about. Because this is why I'm like on this thing because I because Malpass sent me his papers. Right. So. Um, so yeah. So so the so the issue is is that um, if the succession of a finite never gets us an infinite. There's a similar problem that the predecession of an infinite never gives us a finite. Okay. Um, the predecession of a finite of an infinite never gives us a finite. That's right. Okay. But um, what, but but I do agree that there is a sense in which. Um, someone who has, and this is the, the important word here is always, there's an, there's an importance, there's a, a sense in which someone who has always been counting down, um, will in fact achieve a count to zero. And the reason for that is because the set of counted numbers and, um, and the integers can be understood as bijective. Right. So here's here's the thing. So if someone is always counting down, my question to you is can he complete the countdown? Is there so a long, so, 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 so long has so long as he has always been counting down because the okay. way that I the way that I understand that is that um, that is the limit of uh, partial sums. Okay. On on a on an unbound on a, a bounded function, yeah. And would you so, say the same for someone who is always counting up? Would you say there is a point at which he will complete the count up? Yeah, on the on the extended reals, that point just is defined infinitively. Okay, so that so maybe I'm just out of my depth here, but that seems I, I'm just not following that. Well, it so the, 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 you have to, you, the, the, so the thing is is. <sighs> The, the operators in use can be defined in terms of the other. And so the way that I understand the count up is that it is succession into infinity. Now, as, of, as we pointed out, um, the reals are closed under succession, so you can't ever get an infinity. However, um, they are they are countably infinite. And a way to understand that is the way that limits and partial sums work is that if you have an unbounded function towards infinity, uh, it can just be given this point on the extended reals that just is infinity. So it's treated as a point. The, and the is same this point, uh, this point is not an actual real number. No, it's an extended real number is the point. The, what the, what the, is an extended, could you just break it down? What is an extended real number? Yeah, the extended real numbers is the real number line plus the points negative infinity and infinity. Oh, well, I mean, sure, but we're talking about an individual that's counting real numbers. Um, yeah, so, so the, yeah, so the point is, is that, um, the point is, is that there, there is no such thing as subtraction on an Negative and oh, there's no such thing as subtraction on infinity in the reals. That in, infinity is in the real. You need the extended right. reals to even be talking about right, counting down from infinity. But that's well, I'm not. I, 
Well, I just say that an individual. Well, we can even t- do away with the infinity language. We could just say that an individual has always been counting, um, even though it means the same thing. Just that if an individual has always been counting, will the individual? And he's always just to be clear, he's always been counting real numbers. Yeah, it's it's a right? it's a it's a yeah it's a convergent it's a convergent function to zero. That's right. Okay. So the indi- so the individual we agree that the individual that the process this individual is undertaking will eventually stop. Yeah, and then the the issue I have is that for all of these things that are being used, like stop, addition, uh, succession, subtraction, uh, predecession, all of those things can be understood in terms of being the inverse of something else. And so my view, although this might this is just something I'm thinking about now, so it may be indefensible, so I'm appreciating the pushback, is that Stoppage, if we're moving towards this other um, this other half, stoppage now has to be understood in terms of its um, reciprocal, which just is the start. Well, that just seems to beg the question against Malpass's view, because his whole argument is that the reciprocal is asymmetrical. His whole argument is that there is, if the arrow of time, the direction yeah, so, you're going, it makes a difference. So, 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 so the issue, I think, is that and this was the root of the conversation with Venus, is that Venus and I think that there's a sense in which Malpass himself is begging the question. Uh, now, what I will admit is that I have not listened to the AY talk yet, nor have I given his papers the proper treatment, so maybe that there's a further exposition. Um, the way in which the like finitude of, um, of the countdown I don't know that it totally works because the way that I would understand that is in terms of uh, outer measure. And the issue is that the outer measure from a finite point A to an infinite point B just is an infinite measure. So I'm actually not convinced that there actually is a finite distance there. Now, now I, I agree with Jack that there is, there is, uh, the measure of the interval from any point to another point within the set is uh, a finite measure. I, I have I have no issues with the, I have no issues with that claim. And in, in fact, um, the the way that the measure grows could be understood as a boundless function towards infinity. So at no point does it actually reach infinity, but the limit of the partial sums would be understood as an infinity. Yeah, Bryn, my um. My- my iPod or whatever Pro things are not working on Discord right now, so it sucks. Um, but I wasn't making um, I wasn't making Jack's point. I don't think I was. No, no, no I don't. I don't think that you were making Jack's point either. I, I'm just bringing, like uh, recapping the conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I think that Jack's point was Maybe. different, and it's interesting. But I I would want what Maybe. I would want is for Malpass to go through it in terms of measure theory. Well, whatever issue you you have, because I'm not, I'm not. Maybe I'm just out of my depth here, but I just don't see. No, maybe Craig has shown a contradiction on the and shown it to be symmetrical, and I just haven't seen what Craig's argument. But no, no, I don't. I don't think that I, Craig has. I I don't yeah, I don't think Craig has. I do see it with another, and I just, I just don't see the symmetry in that sense. Maybe there are there are symmetries in other senses that there could be problems. With both, but I just don't. Yeah. See it yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so the the way that I understand it is that when you ask for does the thing complete in the one sense, it's not fair to ask it of the other process because it should be understood actually as the inverse, and you should ask does this process ever start? And the answer is yeah, the process started. The process started at zero. And then it's unboundedly growing towards infinite. Well, but that's the whole point that is being made here. The point that when they say that there couldn't be a, I, um, there couldn't be because you would never get here. Malpass is on. You're cutting out a lot. I don't know. We might have to redo this another time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
So I'm reading a response. Um, do you want me to post it or just read it? From if you can 